Okay, we'll call a meeting to order at 3.31. Roll call. I do it. Trustee Crane. Here. Trustee Weigand. Here. Trustee Soilu. Here. Trustee Barto. Here. Trustee Murphy. Here. Trustee Pearson. Here. Trustee Anderson. Dr. Smith. Here. All right, uh, adoption of the agenda. Do I have a motion to adopt the agenda? So moved. Second. And a second? Second. All right, moved by Trustee Weigand, seconded by Trustee Ersolu. Thank you, vote. Trustee Crane? Yes. Trustee Weigand? Yes. Trustee Ersolu? Yes. Trustee Bartow? Yes. Trustee Murphy? Yes. Trustee Pearson? Yes. Trustee Anderson? Okay, the vote was 6-0, uh, one absent. Do we have any community input on closed session items? Seeing that there are none, we will um, go into closed session. Comments on closed session agenda, okay. We will now move to closed session. Items are conference with legal counsel, anticipated litigation, conference with real property negotiator, conference with legal counsel existing litigation, Conference with legal counsel, anticipated litigation. Conference with legal counsel, potential litigation. Wow. Student discipline, conference with labor negotiator. Public employee discipline, dismissal release. And lastly, item I, public employee discipline, dismissal release, employment. And we will return to open session at 6 p.m. Thank you. Uh, call to order, it is 6.01. In, in closed session, the board took action to authorize the superintendent or designee to give notice of non-reelection to a certain certificated employee, CE 2024-01, who shall be released from their certificated position at the conclusion of the current school year pursuant to Ed Code 44954 and 44929.21. And the roll call vote was as follows, seven A's and zero no's. And now we will have a, uh, we will call on our student board member, Siller Reddig, to lead us in the moment of reflection and the Pledge of Allegiance. Place your hand over your, uh, place your right hand over your heart. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. We have standing room only. Welcome, everyone. Um, adoption of the minutes of two thirds. Is the microphone not on, Hank? No. Thank you for whoever said that. <laughs> Tamara. All right, adoption of the minutes. Do I have a motion to adopt the minutes? So, so moved. Second. Who was that? Was that Lisa? Oh, uh, Trustee Barto. Oh, no. Lisa. Trustee no, Pearson. Right. It's, okay, moved by Trustee Pearson and seconded by Trustee Weigand. Roll call vote, please. Trustee Crane? Yes. Trustee Weigand? Yes. Trustee Soilu? Yes. Trustee Bartow? Yes. Trustee Murphy? Yes. Trustee Pearson? Yes. Trustee Anderson? Yes. All right, the vote was unanimous. Um, we move on to item 10, which is uh, recognizing our winter athletics sport champions. Assistant Superintendent Torres. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Awesome. Much better. Okay, thank you. Um, tonight, you can tell it's a full crowd. We have some tremendous athletes that we're going to be recognizing tonight. We are exceptionally proud of these young people. And so at this point in time, I'm going to introduce Dr. Mike Shaka, who's going to walk us through everybody we have this evening. Thank you. President Crane, members of the board, Dr. Smith, executive cabinet, and all the wonderful guests here tonight. It is my privilege to continue our Newport Mesa tradition of honoring our CIF champions. 
Our district has a rich history of exceptional athletic programs, and this winter sports season is no exception. Today, we are going to recognize some of our winter sports champions, our wrestling and water polo champions. I would like to start by inviting Dr. Sean Bolton to introduce his Newport Harbor wrestling program. Thank you, Dr. Shaka. And for the sake of time, I'll just be introducing Coach Witt and Coach Rigo and Coach Ballone, who's also a math teacher at Newport Harbor High School, to come up here and talk about the team. But thank you for the recognition. Thank you. <laughs> he looks like Coach Witt. Hi, everybody. Uh, Coach Witt, we actually had a very amazing season coming in second in state as a team. And three of my athletes are here tonight. First one is freshman Marley Solomon with a 47 and 4 record this season. CIF champ, Masters champ, and fifth place in state as a freshman. Second is Skylar Gassell, who had championships at Queen of the Hill, CIF champion, Masters champion, and fifth place at state while carrying a 4.5 GPA. Oh, wow. And of course, Duda Rodriguez who back-to-back -back won CIF, back-to-back -back won Masters, back-to-back -back won State, made it through her whole entire high school career undefeated, <laughs> and will be off to bigger and better things, I'm sure. So. And now I'll introduce Coach Witt, our boys coach, wrestling. Uh, Rigo, sorry. <laughs> Hi, guys. Uh, thank you for having us here. Uh, first year as a coach uh, in charge of the program. Uh, we have two amazing athletes here. Uh, two, first time ever having two CI champs in our, in our, our school. Two, first time ever had two state qualifiers, three, we had three state qualifiers actually, but we're here to honor these guys that actually were CIF champ. We have Damien Prima, first time CIF champ, and he's a junior. Uh, next we have Anthony Mono, he's a two time CIF, CIF champ, first time in the history of Newport Harbor High School, uh, third at Masters, state qualifier. And he's also a junior, and he'll be back again, and uh, we're having a great season, guys. Thank you, Dr. Bolton, and congratulations to the Newport Harbor, both boys and girls wrestling CIF champions. I'd now like to invite up Dr. Jake Haley to introduce the Corona Del Mar wrestling program. I will follow my counterpart's lead and just say I'm grateful to be here. Thank you for recognizing our wrestling team and program tonight. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Mark Alex, our wrestling coach, as well as our new engineering teacher. Can you bring it up, Mark Alex, come on in. Thank you very much. It's always an honor and a privilege to be here. I'm proud of our young men who did so well this year. I'm going to introduce them together, Antonio Rambaru and Zion Hernandez, CIF champions for this past year. Thank you. 
stand right here. That's good. Antonio's in the blue. Antonio's a 157-pound champion. Zion, 175-pound champion. The reason I brought them out together is because they've been buddies since eight years old, competing in different sports, jujitsu and whatnot, and the wrestling accomplish accomplishments pretty much mirrored each other. Both of them four-time varsity letterman, both of them three-time CIF medalists, both of them two-time team captains, uh, both of them two-time state finalists, a couple, uh, another a huge one going forward, both of them gonna be attending San Francisco State University and wrestling up there in the fall. Obviously, they're both CIF champions this year. Zion, this is his second time as a CIF champion, which is awesome. And Antonio is a top 12 in state two years in a row. Fantastic accomplishments. and you're not done yet, Dr. Haley. Um, at this time, we're gonna let our Corona Del Mar water polo parents come in. So we're gonna have to make a little room in the back of the uh, boardroom for uh, a very large team. And I'm gonna hand it over to uh, Dr. Haley while we're making that transition to share a little bit about our Corona Del Mar water polo. Yes, thank you. Great to be up here again. We'll reiterate the words I mentioned earlier. Thankful to be here and recognizing our CIF Division One champion water polo girls team under the new direction. Uh, first year coach uh, Mark Hunt. Mark, come on up here. Congratulations to you and the team. Um, I would first like to say thank you for uh, recognizing us. We're very honored to be here. Um, we had a fantastic year this year. This is a, a, a fine collection of young ladies that have goal-oriented, set game plans, had an extremely exciting final game, holding off a strong Jay Sarah team. Uh, we went in with a, a, an 11 to five lead and it whittled down to 12 to 11 to the, to the last second. And I, I couldn't be more proud of this group and we're, we're very proud to be here and to represent Corona Del Mar High School. So thank you. Newport Mesa's exceptional individuals it doesn't just translate into our students, it's also our adults, our staff, our teachers who make us also part of the, of the Newport Mesa team. And so we will now move on to recognizing Newport Mesa Unified School District's 2024 Employee Excellence Award recipients. And I would like to ask Annette Franco to come up. To Hi, good evening everyone. I am Annette Franco, Public Relations Officer for our school district, and we are here tonight to recognize five outstanding employees as part of our Employee Excellence Awards Program. 
Nominations included specific examples of nominees going above and beyond their job responsibilities in the areas of collaboration, flexibility, positive attitude, quality work, creativity, and innovation. The five employees recognized this evening exemplify a dedication to our district's mission, creating a positive environment for students, staff, and the community. They continuously display initiative with a high degree of excellence, professionalism, and integrity. To get us started, I'd like to introduce Woodland Principal Kim Maxwell to say a few words about our first honoree. Thank you. Um, thank you for having us. I'm super grateful to be here to honor all five of these um, excellent employees, but particularly our Woodland Library, Library Media Technician, Sarah Bapovich. So Sarah, please come up. And I'm gonna share a little bit about what makes uh, Sarah Bapovich so wonderful. So lovingly known by Woodland students as Mrs. Bubblefish, the magnetic Sarah Babovich takes an inclusive approach to her position as a library media technician. Whether planning activities for Read Across America or Kindness Week or choosing a book to read to students during, during their library time, Mrs. Babovich is thoughtful and intentional. She is known for her attentiveness to students' interests and is always seeking new materials to enhance books, educational concepts in a way that brings the text to life for our young students. As a vital part of the school's positive behavioral interventions and supports, PBIS team. She helps build a positive school culture in which students thrive. She uses every opportunity to share her enthusiasm for literature and learning with students, and she even created a librarian assistant role that students can select, and they do, as a PBIS award. Beyond the library, Babovich is a well-organized, cheerful team member who will eagerly step in for additional student supervision. She's a master at the car line. <laughs> and during fire and other safety drills. She ensures there are no gaps in the communication between school and home, and she is a beacon of, fa of family connection at Woodland. Thank you, Mrs. Babovich. <laughs> Hello, uh, Tiffany Lewis, principal of Anderson Elementary. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Kristen Day. She is um, our TK teacher at Anderson Elementary. And as um, a lot of students' first connection to school, um, Kristen Day understands the importance of creating a positive, nurturing environment from the start. I'm so sorry. Um, is she supposed to come up now? Yeah, sorry. I got so excited. She's so good. <laughs> Sorry. Ah, she creates an engaging learning experience with each child in mind, regularly communicating with parents about their students' successes and her efforts to make school a joyful place every day. Parents have commended Day for her role in supporting students' individual needs, whether with additional attention, targeted instruction, a food allergy-free snack, or simply a reassuring smile. In nominating day, one parent said, Miss Day was always a wealth of information every time I interacted with her. We attribute my son's huge improvements in his first experience in elementary school entirely to his relationship with Miss Day. At the end of the school year, Day presents each student with a gift, a personal letter noting how important they are to her, plus a binder highlighting their progress and special classroom memories. As a testament to the welcoming school culture Day creates, another parent reported her child regularly requests to review the binder so she can relive the fond memories she has of her time with Miss Day. Congratulations.
Good evening, my name is Christy Flores, the Director of Engagement, Partnership, and Expanded Learning, and I would like to invite Christine Olguin to the podium. It is my honor to recognize the Expanded Learning Program Office Assistant, Christine Olguin, as an NMUSD Employee Excellent Award recipient. Christine has been with NMUSD for 18 years, eight of those years serving with the ELOP department. Christine consistently demonstrates an exceptional level of professionalism and dedication in every aspect of her work. Her commitment to excellence is evident through her willingness to go above and beyond, consistently exceeding expectations and doing whatever it takes to ensure the sites are prepared and supported. When asked to characterize Christine, colleagues, consistently use terms like accessible, dependable, collaborative, creative, friendly, and kind. In addition to her exemplary work ethic, Christine approaches challenges with a positive attitude and a solution-oriented mindset, consistently finding innovative and effective solutions to support students, families, and staff. Christine exemplifies the traits of an outstanding employee. Like many others, and many of those are here tonight from our ELOP program. I am grateful for Christine and the chance to celebrate her well-deserved recognition with the entire Newport Mesa community. Please join me in congratulating ELOP Office Assistant Christine Olguin. I'm Depali Potnas, principal of Costa Mesa Middle and High School, and I would be honored to invite John Linforce to come stand next to me. For more than 30 years, John Linforce has encouraged music students at Costa Mesa Middle and High School. In addition to teaching piano, he leads vocal ensemble, concert choir, and madrigal choir, which performed at the district's State of the Schools Breakfast in October 2023. Described as a true gem of a teacher, Mr. Linfors is known among the Mesa community as a compassionate and inclusive towards his students. This welcoming environment that he creates for his students extends to their families. That's probably because he's had their parents as well. <laughs> um, as he stands ready to support the school's young musicians. He will work with students who have scheduling contracts conflicts to ensure that they continue to receive the musical instruction and the guidance that they need. When one family approached him for advice on their student's birthday gift, Mr. Linfors provided specifics for just the right keyboard to suit their child. Mr. Linfors's passion for music is an inspiration to students. Quite frankly, he is an inspiration um, to our staff and myself, and I'm very honored to work side by side him. So congratulations. Good evening, everyone. I'm John Geisler. I'm the Director of Purchasing, and tonight it is my pleasure to recognize Kathy Gutierrez-Miller. <laughs> the, 
process for purchasing supplies and equipment can be daunting, and Kathy is always ready to guide her fellow employees through every step of the process with patience and kindness. She's well known throughout the district as being extremely helpful and handles even the trickiest requests with a friendly smile and expert efficiency. Despite a heavy workload, multiple supervisory changes, personnel changes, and constant supplier challenges, and I mean constant, Kathy always keeps a cool head. She patiently asks questions that help her understand what is needed and then makes suggestions to staff based on her years of experience at Newport Mesa. Even when she is problem solving and thinking outside the box, Kathy strives to address the most complex purchasing issues with a calm demeanor. I'm grateful to have her as a part of my staff. Congratulations. Thank you for allowing us the opportunity to recognize our employees. All right. Moving on to another recognition, which is absolutely amazing, is uh, recognition of Estancia High School and Corona Del Mar High School for being named. Should I just wait? We'll wait a second. We'll take a minute's um, hiatus. That was so cute. If you couldn't guess, Kristen was uh, a preschool teacher. Preschool. Our, our TK, I mean, TK teacher. Right, Dr. Okay, Torres, we'll take it away. We will go ahead and get started. It is an absolute pleasure tonight to share with our Board of Education and our community additional tremendous recognition bestowed upon several of our schools. And tonight I have the pleasure of introducing three items, one for Estancia High School, one for Corona Del Mar, and one for Early College High School. Um, for some of you, you may know that the state of California has a California Distinguished School Program. It actually started in 1985, and it's been going strong ever since. And it's morphed over time to be able to recognize schools for their per academic performance, all the way back from the CSTs to now the SBAC. And so at this point in time, I'm gonna start with um, Mr. Mike Halt and Estancia High School. Would you join me up here, please? We are so pleased tonight to be able to share that Estancia High School has earned their first California Distinguished School. Wow. 
What we know about Estancia High School is they continue to be exceptionally determined to move forward with their instructional focus and to continuously increase student outcomes. Uh, Mr. Halt has been guiding that ship for quite some time, eight years, nine years, something like that. We've lost count. And we are so proud to be able to see the results of their work. The California Distinguished School Program um, this year is for secondary schools, not elementary schools. So I know several of our trustees had that question. And we are so pleased to be able to recognize Estancia for the work that they've been doing and the tremendous growth they have made in each of those categories. The California Distinguished School Program recognizes schools for making growth and progress and then having what they consider exemplary measures. And so I'm so pleased tonight to be able to congratulate Mr. Halt and his school. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be here on behalf of the people who actually earned this award, and that's the, uh, the, the teachers, the students, uh, the parents, uh, not just at Estancia, but throughout the zone. Uh, we uh, were able to earn this award because of the hard work of all the uh, dedicated uh, individuals in the entire Estancia zone, and we appreciate the, the board's support. Thank you. I've had the pleasure of walking Estancia High Schools, um, many, Estancia High School many times, and you do see such tremendous instruction happening in the classrooms, and we're very proud of all the work that he does with his staff. I'd like to welcome up uh, Dr. Jay Cayley so we can talk about Corona Del Mar High School. There you are. Corona Del Mar High School is being recognized as a California Distinguished School for their exceptional student outcome data and their continuous growth and progress towards increasing college readiness and college acceptance and everything that comes with the uh, Distinguished School Award. Dr. Haley, when asked um, what, you know, what you attribute this award to, he talked about a firm commitment to best first instruction. He talked about a firm commitment um, to building relationships and being able to engage students on a daily basis. And when you walk the halls of Corona Del Mar, you absolutely see that. And we're so proud tonight to be able to congratulate you and your staff and your students for the outstanding academic performance. Thank you so much, and I'll be brief again. This is a, an award earned by our student body, by our fantastic teachers, by our school community, uh, our, our fabulous feeder schools that feed in uh, in the Corona Del Mar zone, and also our, our parent community and the strong supports that they give. As you know, it's a long-standing history in the district as well as our zone for outstanding education. This is the fourth time we've received this recognition. Uh, last time was 2007 for us, so we're happy to be back on the map. I'm proud of the student efforts in just a single year in my time. Uh, being at the school, watching their growth, their commitment uh, to con continuing to move the needle. So uh, thank you so much for the recognition tonight. Please. Both of those awards were issued by the California Department of Education. That's a local state program. Our next award that we have this evening is for Dr. Dave Martinez and Early College, which has, he has been recognized by the US Department of Ed. So Dr. Martinez, would you come up, please? We are very pleased to share and congratulate Early College for their um, recognition in not one area, but two areas. So the US Department of Ed has a program that's been uh, going on since 1982, recognizing exemplary schools in the United States. And since the exception, uh, inception of this program, there's only been about 10,000 schools that have been recognized as a uh, blue ribbon school, national blue ribbon school. And we are so pleased to be able to have one of those recognitions. So not only did uh, Dr. Martinez uh, 
complete an application for this process to win one award, but he won two. <laughs> And so uh, Early College is being recognized as a Blue Ribbon School of Excellence Lighthouse School and National Blue Ribbon School. A Blue Ribbon School is an exceptionally high bar to meet. As you know, we only have several schools in our district who've ever achieved that. And so we set the bar here. And then a Lighthouse School is even up here. And what gets you to be a lighthouse school that is truly exemplary student outcomes and metrics that color what we have in early college. So when that visiting team came out to be able to evaluate our school, they were extremely impressed with the student outcomes and the drive of the teachers who help our students achieve last year 100% college eligibility. And, um, and uh, yeah, I know. We have about 200 kids at early college, and so when you think about how many, and, and Dr. Munitiz will share, but when you think about how many students pass through there, we were, you know, every year they keep getting better and better and closer and closer, and so they finally did that. And so he is a lighthouse school, which means he's a beacon. That's the way the, the U.S. Department of uh, Education describes it, so he has not one, but two awards that he's going to share with you tonight. I'm gonna put these down so they don't weigh me down. <laughs> well, I thank you for the opportunity tonight. Thank you, Assistant Superintendent Torres. Um, I'm gonna harken back to 2018. That was our year. That was our year where we had our WASC visit and uh, we challenged each other as a staff of what we can make ourselves to be excellent, strive to be excellent. And you know, I don't know if people realize four years ago yesterday was when the World Health Organization said COVID-19 is a pandemic. And I remember telling our staff, this is, we're in a boat, we're just gonna hit choppy waters, we're gonna get through this. Because we knew that if we're gonna strive for this, it's gonna capture a five year period of time. So I'd like to thank our students, parents, staff that have gone through this journey. Uh, that lighthouse, that's the only one in California. We're the only California school to earn this lighthouse in the world. And again, that is, uh, it's an indication of the hard work of our staff and the instructional strategies. I wear this AVID pin with pride because you can't spell my first name without AVID. <laughs> Slap a D in the front, you've got my name. Uh, but that's been, that's been our lens and our focus. And you know, if you know anything about a lighthouse, it's got a pretty strong lens to it and it's to shine the light. Uh, so we've used that and it's uh, again, basically our instructional strategies, but also when we got back from the pandemic, Early College has been known as the rigor relevance and relationship school and we said, you know, we need to reverse that. We gotta get to relationships with our kids, relate it, and then the rigor will come and it'll take care of itself. So very fortunate, 2023 was a banner year for us, very proud of it. You met our four students that earn Angel Scholars, very happy about that. That was the most of any school to receive that. Uh, we've been a PBIS school, earning platinum three times. We're going forward for a fourth year, and that's what we do. We just go for it. We just want to tr blaze a trail. So you probably should have put the timer on me, but I'm done. <laughs> Thank you again. <laughs> Now we move on to student board member reports. Trustee Wygant. Thank you. Um, the topic this, uh, this month is, with three months left in the school year, how do you and your classmates stay focused on finishing the year strong? And please share two campus highlights. On the dais today is Sailor Reddick from Monte Vista High School. Dear members of the Newport Mesa Unified School District, as we find ourselves with merely three months left in the school year, it is essential to reflect on how we can all collectively finish this academic journey with strength and determination. Today, I stand before you, or sit, to share insights gathered from conversations with my fellow peers, highlighting different perspectives on maintaining focus, and then two highlights from our campus at Monta Vista Independent Studies. Firstly, I spoke with a student who expressed a practical, a practical approach to staying on track. 
They emphasize the importance of completing assignments promptly, not exactly because he wants to, but as a necessity to earn the credits needed for graduation. This statement resonates with many of us, understanding that the consequences of falling behind can be a powerful motivator to remain focused. Another student shared their strategy of staying ahead in classes, seeing the final stretch as an opportunity for proactive learning. This approach speaks to the idea of not just meeting requirements, but exceeding them, embracing the challenge of learning and growing until the last day. For me personally, I believe the key to ending the year strong lies in balance. Balancing school, work, family, and social life may seem like a juggling act, but I found that dedicating time to each S each aspect prevents burnout. Many of my peers agreed and that when we distribute our efforts evenly, we find motivation and eagerness to succeed, creating a positive note to end the year on. Now allow me to present two highlights from Monta Vista independent studies that showcase our commitment to student enrichment and creating a vibrant campus community. From February 12th to the 16th, Monta Vista Independent Studies held a Let's Be Kind event. During this week, our campus took the opportunity to further highlight its pre-existing positivity and inclusivity bound within Monta Vista. We, we set up a delightful photo booth, gave away t-shirts that represented kindness, made friendship bracelets, and even celebrated with a cozy hot chocolate and fuzzy socks day. Mm -hmm. This event was not just about kindness, but also about building connections and making memories together. These connections are continuously happening at Monta Vista, where we are currently monitoring the big bear bald eagles, Shadow and Jackie, incubate their <laughs> eggs, which has influenced a mindset of love for creation of life and building connections for staff and students on campus. The second highlight speaks to our dedication to providing diverse learning experiences. Monta Vista Independent Studies recently incorporated workshops tailored for students from seventh to 12th grade. For our middle schoolers, we introduced a 12-week coding program. This program allows students to delve into the world of coding for 90 minutes a week, fostering critical thinking and technological, or, and technological knowledge. On the other hand, our high school students are engaged in a six-week art program focused on Chinese brush painting. This opportunity allows students to explore their creativity and cultural understanding through a hands-on experience. In conclusion, as my peers and I navigate these final months of the school year, we plan on staying diligent through our classes and ending on a strong and positive note. Whether it's staying ahead in classes, meeting graduation requirements, or finding a balance, each approach contributes to our collective success. Furthermore, the vibrant events and enriching workshops at Monta Vista Independent Studies remind us of the unique opportunities our district provides for growth and learning. Thank you for your time, and let's finish this year strong together. That's great. Thank you, Sailor. That was well written and well executed. Good job. Uh, next, we have Brianna Garcia from Newport Harbor High School. Hello, and good evening, Superintendent Smith, President Crane, and esteemed board members. For this meeting's topic, I went around asking students how they continue to stay motivated during the last three months of the school year. Many responded that they keep themselves reminded of how close the next break is. For example, <laughs> spring break is only four weeks away, so students tell themselves to get past one week at a time until they make it to the weekend where they can relax and have some time to themselves. By taking the last three, last three months of school week by week, students have said that it makes time feel like it's going faster and each week is just seven more days closer to summer. Students are also made, motivated to keep their grades up because they know that it will make finals week less stressful. The fun events hosted by groups such as ASB also make students feel motivated. An example of this is our first campus highlight, which was grade wars that happened last Thursday. This rally is a great way to get a wide student involvement as the whole school goes out to the stadium to watch their classmates play in fun games like tug of war, capture the flag, and dodgeball. Grade Wars is one of the most look forward to events at Harbor as the competition between grades becomes a fun and friendly rivalry. Events such as Grade Wars keep students focusing, focused on finishing the school year as the anticipation for these events makes a fun environment at Harbor. Another event that students have looked forward to this year was our theater's production of High School Musical. Thank you to Costa Mesa High School for kindly letting us use their theater this weekend. It was a great play and our theater company did amazing. The second campus highlight I would like to talk about 
occurs this week from Monday to Thursday, and it is state testing. <laughs> I know you might be thinking, really, state testing is a campus highlight. But it most definitely is an important event this year as our staff, students, and PTA have worked hard to create a positive environment around the idea of state testing. For those who don't, do not know, Harbor has implemented a new testing schedule for this week where an hour and a half of the day is dedicated for the juniors who are taking state tests. Along with this new schedule, students are greeted every morning before tests with a snack table and fun music to get them ready and in a good mood. Many teachers have also had discussions with their class about the importance of why students should try their best on state testing. Harbor hopes that this effort put into state testing will result in increased test scores. Overall, the first three months of the semester have been filled with exciting exciting events, and we hope to see the same energy in the last three months with so much to look forward to, such as our dance show, Arrayas, our student staff basketball game, our dance hosted by the Latinos Unidos Club, and much more. Thank you. Thank you, Brianna. I like how you're um, making the everyday uh, testing even exciting. That's right. So. Yeah, that was like Great. impressive. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we move on to Harvard Council PTA report. Julie Lang. Uh, good evening, uh, President Crane, Superintendent Smith, trustees, cabinet, and um, student representatives and guests. My name is Julie Lank, and I am the financial reviewer for Harbor Council, and I'm nervous. <laughs> I'm providing this month's report on behalf of our president, um, Cynthia Strassman. She sends her regards. Okay, during our um, meeting last week, our PTA units were recognized by the mayor of Newport Beach, Will O'Neill, and the mayor of Costa Mesa, John Stevens, for their commitment and endeavors to increase enrichment opportunities opportunities for our students. Also, the Newport um, Mesa School Board President, Carol Crane, presented a certificate of recognition to each of our units, thanking them for all they do for our schools and students. Thank you, Carol, we really appreciate it. We felt very honored to have you do that. Thank you. Yeah, Additionally, you. Assemblywoman Diane Dixon sent her regrets in not being able to attend our meeting, but provided each of our PTAs with a, certi a certi certification of recognition from the, the California State Assembly, thanking them for their commitment to providing support and resources to strengthen the Newport Mesa School District and its students. Lastly, we celebrated our PTA's birthdays with a message from their principals, a personalized birthday card, and a cupcake. Our PTA's birthdays range from seven years to 98 years. Newport Elementary is 98 years old, their PTA is. Okay. On to Sacramento Safari. Sacramento Safari was held February 26th and 27th. As shared last month, we sent a few of our, our council PTA officers to attend 4th District PTA advocacy trip to Sacramento. 80 PTA people attended, representing all of Orange County and Southeast Los Angeles County. Half a million public school students. During the two-day visit, our attendees heard from many speakers on issues affecting our children and youth, including upcoming bills. On the second day, the attendees met with their local legislators and our staffers to thank them for improving public education for our kids and encouraging them when addressing California's anticipated budget shortfall to continue prioritizing the needs of children, youth, and families by sustaining those measures that help them the most and give them hope for their future. Also, to protect Prop 98, the school base, school base funding. Okay, I want to share with you some PTA happenings this month. Uh, to close this evening's report, we'd like to share this month's PTA happenings. Adams PTA just finished the nationwide Read Across America and invited a storyteller from Seagramstum to share interactive stories with the children. Costa Mesa PTA 
Got Talent editions are underway, open to all student grades seven through 12. They're looking for musicians, singers, dancers, rappers, actors, comedians, magicians, and jugglers, March 19th through the 21st. East Bluff PTA is kicking off Wild West Week on the 18th with an assembly that focus, focuses on the California Gold Rush. Killybrook PTA sponsored a Wills Squared Assembly, 101 Dalmatians Musical, Family Literacy Night, Walk Through History Assembly, and participated in Read Across America. Mariners PTA has organized a family steam fest, sponsored the school play, and sponsored ima imagination machine assemblies. Newport Coast PTA has scheduled an art master le lecture and lessons for its students. The Wizard of Oz Junior sixth grade play is March 23rd and 24th. Newport LPTA has organized a BMX anti-bullying assembly and Brain Tree STEM Days and a Beauty and the Beast musical. Newport Heights PTA just finished Read Across America with themes for each day. Book Fair is next week, Art Masters, and Ru the Run Club starts on um, the 20th. There are several of our Newport Mesa Unified School District elementary schools who are participating in Battle of the Books competition on March 21st at the Senior Oasis Center. We are rooting for their success. Thank you. <laughs> All right, next we have a CSEA report. CSEA President Amy Ching. Uh, good evening, President Tr Crane, trustees, Superintendent Smith, cabinet, and guests. CSEA would like to congratulate those receiving the District's Employee Excellence Awards, Estancia Corona Del Mar, and Early College High School for their achievements. Also, the amazing athletes that were recognized tonight. At our chapter meeting last week, our members voted on and approved two MOUs with the District. One MOU rectified a benefit, a benefit discrepancy for one nutrition services assistant too. The other MOU corrected compensation for four IAs whose actual work required that they be moved to another classification, resulting in increased compensation. I want to point out that CSEA brought forth one, the information for one IA. However, Leona and her team did not just make the correction and move on. They performed an investigation and found that there were three additional members whose classification and salary needed to be corrected. This MOU corrects the discrepancy for all. We thank Leona and her team for their detailed and thorough work. We are looking forward to celebrating Classified School Employee Week, May 19th through 25th. The executive board, our executive board, <laughs> is working on fun and fresh ideas and ways to celebrate. Usually during this week, the district plans in collaboration with CSEA, ACE Day, a day appreciating classified employees, which is a collaboration that builds relationships and awareness between administration and classified staff. It's a fun-filled day for all who participate, and I think many of you have, and I hope we all do that again. It's really a great day. Uh, last but not least, CSEA thanks the board in advance for receiving our initial proposer, proposal for contract reopener and sunshining it later this evening. We look for, forward to utilizing the LMI training that we've received having, and having a productive and mutually beneficial conversation. We look forward to continuing the good work for students, staff, and the community. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Next, we have NMFT's comments with Tamara Fairbanks. Good evening, President Crane, Dr. Smith, fellow trustees and honored guests and staff. I want to also recognize all of those who have been honored tonight and all of you are inspirations to me, especially John Linfors, music teacher, yeah. extraordinaire. Yeah. And I bow to him because, yeah. it's because all of the hard work that our staff 
does, and it's the little stuff, the detailed stuff that just brings, that uplifts our district and our communities. Mm -hmm. This week is parent-teacher conference week, and I want to acknowledge all of the elementary staff members who have made this week possible. It is important to have that connection with our parent groups and to really join together with our parents to address goals, progress, and see what our, what, how we can enhance our students' lives for the rest of the school year. And so this week, I just want to acknowledge those elementary staff that are working the midnight oil to make sure that they're meeting with their parents, that they're really communicating the students' needs and really doing the positive and making sure that the lives of our students are enhanced. Um, also, March, if you don't know, is Arts in Our Schools Month. And I want to acknowledge our secondary VAPA staff throughout our entire district. Our visual and performing arts staff is doing, are doing exhibitions, showcases, concerts all over the place. For instance, Newport Harbor High School Vocal Ensemble is doing their Vocal Zone concert with the elementary school on Friday night at St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church. Mm -hmm. And so it's those moments, it's those um, pivotal zone concerts, those events that really bridge all aspects, all ages of our community into finding their humanity in the arts. We are also excited for some of our upcoming events, not just in March, but throughout the rest of the school year. But one of the things just those, is the details. So knowing how much goes into a drama production, and once you realize how much goes into it, you realize, wow, you see the passion and the love that our certificated staff has for our students and for their craft. And, that's, and that ends my message. Thank you. Thank you. We now move on to community input on non-agendized items. And we do have a couple. So Trustee Arsordo. This is an opportunity for the public to address the board regarding items not on the regular meeting agenda. Comments on non-agenda topics are limited to three minutes per comment, up to 20 minutes per topic. A speaker may not relinquish his her time to another person. By order of the Brown Act, Section 54954.2, the board will take no action nor have any discussion on non-agendized items. The superintendent may provide clarification during superintendent comments. Thank you. Well, I'd like to call Amy Kalachi, and next is Andrea Bray. Good evening, board members. My name is Amy Kalachi. I'm here to advocate on behalf of classified staff for the summer assistance program, the CSESAP. <coughs> I was a classroom teacher for 10 years in Irvine before um, staying home with our firstborn, who is in first grade now at Woodland Elementary School. We love it there, it's amazing. <laughs> uh, we also have a son in TK and a two-year-old, so we'll be in this district for a while. <laughs> Um, as an educator and now parent, I've noticed that it's harder and harder to hang on to really good classified staff. Um, my own children benefit greatly from these wonderful people as dedicated staff members. They have such an impact on our students. Many are known and loved by the entire student body and oftentimes they know every kid's name. As the kids move from grade to grade and teacher to teacher, some of our classified staff is a constant for them and the only people they may see from, for more than one year. The point I'm trying to make is how important these people are, especially to our most vulnerable population of kids. My own child has a one-on-one -on -one instructional assistant and we'd be devastated to lose her. Um, especially to a district that has opted into this program. So we wanna keep Newport Mesa as competitive as possible with pay to keep um, our staff able to survive in this county. Um, our kids deserve this as well. 
I've watched as our school has also struggled to fill some of these classified positions. It's important that Newport Mesa attract the best. Currently, the pay schedule is 10 to 11 months, leaving a huge gap during the summer that sometimes results in career change or loss of staff. We don't want that. We don't want to lose our best, and we want to fill those, all those unfilled positions. This program will help us stay competitive and allow our staff members we know and love to have a little more security and pay during those summer months to continue to be able to support our students. Please take into consideration this program that would be imperative to keeping our district as high achieving as possible, as well as keep these connections strong for our kids' social and emotional well-being. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Andrea Bray. Hello, my name is Andrea Bray, and I'm here to talk as a Newport Mesa employee and as a former student, and to keep in the theme of the night, a CIF swimmer, second oh, to last place, right. but still proud of that. <laughs> um, so I'm a big believer of giving back to your community. I was raised in Costa Mesa, and I'd like to eventually retire and live out the rest of my life in Costa Mesa. And as of right now, I don't see that as a possibility as being a behavioral interventionist. Um, this, I believe this program will definitely benefit us in the long run. During summer times, we try to find extra work, but it's just not enough to keep us in California, let alone the county. And we love our jobs so much. We love our students. We really don't want to try to find another position. And most of us have been going to school for this, and so we would want to continue our education to become teachers. And with the Summer Savers program, it'll definitely help us in the long run by saving money and also will help us not go into credit card debt from the summer just to pay for our food. And yeah, I really believe the Summer Saver program will keep some of our best employees. It'll keep us in the state. It won't, it won't be competitive for any other school districts. And yeah, that, that's about it. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you for having me. Thank you. <laughs> Superintendent comments? I think all I would add is, is as uh, As luck would have it tonight, um, we're going to be sunshining proposals to begin that process. And so as we start to have comments at board meetings about negotiations, I, I won't have much to say about that. So I just want to make sure that the audience knows no one's being ignored. We just really want to honor that process. I, too, am really excited, as uh, President Ching said, um, to get together and to discuss these shared interests and figure out how we best um, serve our employees who are serving our students directly uh, across the board. So we're excited about that. We're excited to implement what we've learned with the California Labor Management Initiative for two years. But just wanted to make sure that people understand that it would be inappropriate for me to make too many comments about those items once we start that process, which begins tonight. We're excited about that, so thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, community input on agendized items. We do have one. It's uh, Mich Michelle Martin and, or sorry, Michaela Martin. Michaela, would you like to wait to, till we get to the item itself, or do you want to speak now? Now would be great. All right. Uh, uh, Dr. Asoli will need to read her part first. Got to read this. Okay. This is an opportunity for the public to address the board regarding items on the regular meeting agenda. Comments on agenda items are limited to three minutes per comment, up to 20 minutes per topic. A speaker may not relinquish his or her time to another person. Speaker cards for items on the discussion action calendar may be held until that item is considered by the board if the speaker prefers. Thank you for that. Our agenda item is the very last one and unfortunately will not be able to stay for that entire time. Uh, good evening, Madam President and members of the board. My name is Michaela Martin and I am the Policy and Government Affairs Manager for First Five Orange County. First Five Orange County is dedicated to improving the well-being of young children and families. We were established 25 years ago when the voters approved a portion of tobacco taxes that is dedicated solely to children ages zero to five, programming and supports. 
We are the local public agency that administrates those funds for all of Orange County. I'm here tonight to thank you all as you're voting to accept funding from our agency. We're looking at under, <laughs> entering the the time change has thrown off my public speaking. I've done like three of these week. And I don't know, like usually I do so great. And like now I'm like reading and it's like, it's becoming a problem. Um, hopefully with sleep I'll be able to move past this. But um, we wanted to take a moment to talk, just highlight a few things about our kindergarten readiness initiative. The first is community engagement. With these partnerships, we've been able to support over 23,000 families with our early learning and health related materials and resources. We've been able to provide technical assistance that has supported Orange County districts to draw down over $50 million uh, annually for preschool services. And we conduct the Early Developmental Index or EDI. With the EDI tool, um, it has provided uh, a mechanism to look at how we allocate our resources forming strategic partnerships with community organizations and enhancing curriculum and learning activities. Notably, we are the only county in the country that has 100% district participation in the EDI. So I also would like to thank your early learning specialist, Kathleen Leary, who works directly with our staff and consultants. Um, again, <coughs> We wouldn't be able to do this work without your partnership and all of the district partnerships. So we just wanted to take the moment to say thank you. Thank you. We now move on to achievement, uh, a report on secondary success metrics. Assistant Superintendent Torres. Yes, thank you. And it has definitely been a night for secondary. Uh, and tonight we have for you a presentation to share some data sets with you. Uh, we don't get to where we are without actually focusing and really investing in our uh, instructional program and measuring our metrics. And so I'd like to welcome up at this time Dr. Mike Shaka and Keith Carmona, and hopefully that'll turn on. And hopefully the right presentation will pop up. We had some Google challenges today, so hopefully that'll work. Great. Um, and he's going to share with you, the team tonight um, is going to share with you uh, several data sets that we really continuously monitored throughout the year. You heard a little bit tonight about Estancia High School and a California Distinguished School. You heard about Corona Del Mar. You heard about early college. And again, I can't reiterate enough that we don't get to those places without really digging deep into our student outcome data and refining our instructional program, making adjustments to our resources to ensure that student outcomes continue to meet our, our standard and exceed all of our goals. So tonight, um, Dr. Shaka and Keith Carmona will be sharing that with you. Go ahead and get, I hope it's working tonight. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> President Crane, members of the board, Dr. Smith, executive cabinet, and all of the guests. Uh, you know, having those TK students up here hugging their teacher, that's a tough act to follow, so <laughs> we'll do our best. Yeah. <laughs> um, as Su Assistant Superintendent Torres said, it's a, it's a fitting night to talk about some of our secondary success metrics because we had the recognition of Estancia and Corona Del Mar and early college, and those are recognition based off of achievement metrics. It's not just because we feel like they're doing a good job, it's because we can identify clear metrics that measure the things we think are important and then progress monitor them and measure them at the end. So that's what we're gonna talk about today, just some of the secondary success metrics that lead to our overarching goals. The first uh, graphic I wanna show you is what we in secondary have, have dubbed the matrix. And of all the work that we've done in secondary, this is one of the accomplishments I personally am most proud of from our team because so much work went into this. And in a nutshell, what this has done is it's identified four core areas, literacy, core curriculum, graduation, and college and career readiness. And then what our team has done is we've kind of backwards mapped as to uh, what, if you look at the column four, what those key success metrics that would measure success in those four areas are. So for example, we have um, smarter balance scores, we have graduation rate, we have A to G rates, and, and, and these metrics that we look at as these, these uh, summative type metrics that we really want to um, move, move the needle on. 
Then what we've done is if you look over to the column three, those are our progress monitoring metrics, our on-track metrics. How do we know it's working in real time, still with time left for us to take action and make adjustments? And that's something that we spend a lot of time doing is how can we identify what's working, what's not, and take action in the moment and not just um, examine data after the fact. So this is something that we, um, as a team have committed to, have spent time, um, it's, a, it's a living document, and so we're always adjusting and examining this um, as to is it really measuring what we care most about. So what we're talking tonight is generally related to board priority num uh, number one, which is improvement in academic achievement. And if you look at this hourglass graphic over, over on the right side, really what we're talking about is three different points in time. One is the bottom half, where we're talking about the experience and supports that our kids get while in the Newport Mesa School District. All of those things that we do. And they all come together at one single point in time and location, which we call graduation. And that's really what we work towards for all of our students, is how can we get them to that moment in time to successfully graduate. And then upon graduation, the hourglass opened back up, and the idea there is how can we arm our kids post-graduation to have as many options as possible to where they get to choose and not only have options, but are equipped to be successful in those options. So that's kind of a, a, a guiding graphic that we like to think about in secondary. So let's start by looking at graduation rate. This is Newport Mesa, district-wide, our graduation rate over the last three years. And what you can see is over those last three years from 2021 um, all the way until last year, 2023, our graduation rate has gone up. That's a positive. We have more students reaching the uh, rigorous bar of graduation in Newport Mesa. Once you start drilling down into that data, we start looking at our different student groups. And where, where are we um, more effective? Where is there still work to do? So if you look um, at our English learners, our English learners, we took a dip from 2021 to 2022, but now we're back on the upward trajectory um, and moving in the right direction up to 84.7% um, graduation rate. Our low SES, low income students, again, you can see a steady increase over the last three years in graduation rate. And then our students with disabilities, again, you see a similar trend where we took a dip in 2022 and now we're back on the upward trajectory in 2023. This tells a couple stories. Um, one is that we are headed overall in the right direction currently, but two, there's still work to do. And until our graduation rate is 100%, we still have work to do and always want to continue moving in that direction. But it is showing positive growth and you're gonna see a lot of um, acknowledgement and, and uh, praise for growth. We don't just look at, oh, you, you, you arbitrarily crossed some um, proficiency line, but more, are we always growing? Are we always improving? So as we talked about going back to that matrix, okay, graduation's great, but that's a piece of data we look at one point in time and we say, great, fantastic. Uh, but for those cases we don't say great and fantastic to, how do we avoid getting there in the first place? And one of our key progress monitors for graduation are student grades. They're, they're a very helpful metric that we can measure formally every four and a half weeks and informally in real time using our Schoology accounts. Uh, but, but for the sake of this conversation, really looking at every four and a half weeks, we have official grading reports and we can look at what, what you're looking at right here is what percentage of the grades issued are A's, B's, and C's. Now again, um, multiple stories being told here, but what you can see is that from 2021 all the way to first semester of this year, 23-24, uh, we've gone up in the number, uh, in the percentage of A's, B's, and C's being issued uh, district-wide. So that's a positive trend. And if this is truly predictive of graduation rate, we hope that we see um, positive outcomes in our graduation rate as we move into this year. Looking at some of our student groups, our English language learners, um, this is, this is a, another um, area that we are really excited about seeing the growth and the trajectory of. 53% um, in 2021, all the way up to 68% in 23, 24 this last semester. Again, headed in a really positive direction. This is um, due to the work of a lot of people, Laura Del Passion, her team, Keith Carmona and his team, so uh, all of our site leadership and the teachers, a lot of work is really being done to prioritize um, continued growth with our English language learners. Our low um, socioeconomic students, um, again, you're seeing the arrow headed in the right direction. 
um, from 69% up to 82% um, currently. If this is predictive of graduation rate, we would love to see um, positive results in graduation rate for this um, group of students as well. And then finally, course grades with students uh, with disabilities. You can see overall the upward trajectory. We did take um, uh, a 1% dip last year first semester, but that has rebounded. We're up to 80% of the grades issues, issued are A's, B's, and C's in this area. So if you look at next steps um, and really what this means, um, what we want to continue to do is first and foremost, um, continue to align grading practices to make sure we have consistency from class to class, from school to school, um, at grade to grade, so that we have as much consistency as possible in how we calculate and issue grades. Some of our uh, sites are doing some great work starting to explore the idea of grading for equity. Uh, we're really excited about uh, the work they're going to they're starting to explore there. Um, we want to continue our focus on formative assessments. Again, looking at data after the fact is not as helpful as looking at data in the moment that we can act upon. So those formative of assessments can be a fantastic tool for us um, to respond to real-time data. And then again, I know you've heard about it before, but I would, I, I always have to mention this, the amazing work that our admin intern graduation coaches are doing. Um, a lot of that increase in data correlates with the introduction and growth of our admin intern graduation coach program. So it's great to see um, their hard work pay off in our data as well. And now I'm gonna hand it over to Keith Carmona to take us through some more data points. Well, thank you trustees, President Crane, executive cabinet for allowing us the opportunity to, to speak about uh, all the great work that's happening in secondary ed. So Dr. Shaka spoke about uh, some of the metrics that we use to kind of gauge how students are making progress. Um, what we'd like to talk about now is highlighting a handful of programs that connect back to uh, that matrix that we showed at the beginning of the presentation. So one of the areas of emphasis in that matrix was college and career ready. Um, and so the programs that I'm gonna share with you, um, some data points on really tie to our students' ability uh, to be college and career ready upon graduation from high school. Uh, the first, and you heard reference and, and Dr. Martinez's um, uh, reference to the AVID program and his pride in the AVID program at, at early college um, is uh, one program that really seeks to try to equip all students um, from all sorts of backgrounds to be college, uh, college ready upon graduation. Um, so as you look at the slide um, over the last three years, we We've seen an increase in the number of students that are accessing our AVID program, um, and that has um, a tremendous benefit for students being able to um, be A through G ready and college ready upon graduation. As we look at um, the high schools, um, we are seeking to grow our AVID program at each of our high schools, um, starting with Costa Mesa High School. Um, that is a, a school that we are growing the AVID program. I was in their 11th grade class today and they were doing amazing work. That's the, the highest level of AVID we have this year. Those kids are gonna be applying to colleges next year as our, our first group of AVID seniors. Um, at early college, um, just a, a slight decrease in the number of students that were in the AVID program, but that really represents over 60% of the kids um, at early college are in the AVID program, and we saw earlier tonight really what that means for that campus. Um, at Estancia, um, we're working on um, building back some of the strong numbers that we saw in years past and, and actually met with uh, Principal Halt today and the AVID teacher to really examine what that looks like. And of course, we're really proud of the incredible program that's at Newport Harbor. As we look at our middle school programs, again, we're growing that program um, at Costa Mesa and excited about the articulation between the middle and high school. Um, our Ensign team has really come on strong with that program. And uh, T. Winkle uh, has uh, one of our largest and strongest uh, programs. It is worth noting that while the numbers did drop from last year, that is a result of the fact that we've widely expanded the number of elective opportunities for kids at that campus. So naturally, kids are gonna have more choices, um, still offering a robust pro, uh, AVID program, but also giving kids a wonderful opportunity to do um, some incredible things. Um, so some of our next steps in AVID would be increasing students benefiting fr uh, the, from the AVID elective course, so just giving more access to it, um, training all teachers on um, kind of the tenets of AVID, which we call WICKER. It's the writing, inquiry, collaboration, organization, and reading. Um, our schools have had the opportunity to go visit other um, AVID programs in Southern California this year to see how they're implementing it, and that's been a, a, a really great benefit. Um, we are looking at expanding the 
the AVID uh, options at our elementary school. You're aware that um, right now Ray Elementary is our, is our one AVID school at the elementary school, so we're um, looking at expanding that in the coming years, which would just you know, further some of the data that I've already showed you. Um, and then really leaning in on zone articulation. Um, last week, our superintendent met with us and talked about the importance of um, having coherence and alignment you know, across our schools and across our zones, and that's the good work that um, our AVID teachers are excited about doing. So as we pivot um, to a different program, um, now we would like to highlight uh, a program that also connects to that piece on the matrix, which is that college and career ready piece. Uh, several months ago at a board meeting, we shared with you the incredible work that's being done in a pilot program at Estancia High School around um, looking at our newcomers, our English learners that have recently arrived to the country um, and how we are supporting them in um, algebra. Um, and this is important for several reasons. Number one, um, algebra is more or less the gatekeeper for students being A through G college ready um, when they graduate high school. And secondly, if you're new to the country and you're learning the language, um, that is already difficult. And then layering on w mathematics instruction, which can already seem like a foreign language, is difficult. And so um, under the leadership of, of uh, Mr. Halt, um, Estancia has been uh, teaching a bilingual newcomers algebra course that has had incredible success. Um, and so based upon the numbers that, I'm, that we're showing you here, um, by comparison, uh, last year the percentage of English learners um, passing Math 8, so those students that were uh, eighth graders last year was about 67%. And now just for a frame of reference, that doesn't even include just the newcomers, that's all English learners. Now we pivot to this year and the students that are in that class, those uh, newcomers, 86.4 of them are currently passing algebra. And when we say it's algebra, it is true algebra. That is not a watered down version of algebra. It is the robust algebra uh, that we know of. Um, some additional positive outcomes from that newcomer pilot um, is that the students are feeling uh, stronger and more confident in their academic abilities. And so the, what the graph on the right or the left demonstrates is the overall GPAs of the students that are in that course being successful. So those students have a combined GPA of 3.3. That's incredible. Um, by comparison, Estancia students 9 through 12 have a combined GPA of 2.88 and our English learners at Estancia right now have a combined GPA of 2.34. So it is a small class that we're running this pilot, but the, um, the outcomes are incredible and it really speaks to creating an inclusive environment, really meeting students' needs and providing um, high expectations, but supporting them in, in meeting those expectations. Um, the other piece that we wanna speak to is, you know, we talk about the need to, to educate the whole child. So while on the, hand, on the one hand, we're seeking to, provide support for their academic needs. The other part of it that's incredible is that 50% of those students are participating in one or more extracurricular programs, CTE classes, sports, band, and so you can imagine how we're connecting with those kids who probably otherwise may be disconnected. So some of our next steps with the newcomer pilot program is that we would like to continue to support that successful uh, program in the coming years. Um, we are seeking to replicate the, the successful aspects of that instruction in other environments within the district and then explore that model for other schools that have larger uh, numbers of newcomers. So in talking about algebra as being the gatekeeper to college readiness, um, one of the other metrics that we track is students' success in algebra. So similarly to the course grades that Dr. Shaka referred to before, um, we are looking at how students are performing in algebra one. Um, that is kind of the benchmark for student success. Um, and so over the last three years, and we only have the semester one data for this year, it's been about flat in terms of um, the student success in those courses. Um, but that is something that we're going to continue to monitor to ensure that we can have more students um, being successful in Algebra 1. So our, our next steps with that, because that is such a priority at the high school level, is um, the board's investment in the algebra pre-teach course, which is that supplemental class uh, designed to support students who naturally may struggle or historically may struggle in algebra. We are gonna continue to um, invest in, in that program. Um, the board has, uh, 
deeply invested in professional development and we have math teachers that are excited about trying to engage students in new and exciting ways, calling upon some of the work that's done in that newcomer um, pilot class, um, the instructional coaching and really leveraging our principals as the instructional leaders, and then constantly using the data that we're seeing from our benchmark assessments and then also from the state assessments to allow us to, uh, to allow that to guide our decisions. The last program that I that we want to talk about tonight and just kind of demonstrate the progress that we're making is um, advanced placement. So again, going back to that matrix, we're talking about you know the metrics that we can measure readiness for college. And of course, if you're enrolled in an AP class and taking an AP class, you're obviously demonstrating a, a readiness for college, but you know probably likely achieving college credit. So over the last three years, you can see that we have significantly increased overall the number of students enrolled in AP courses district wide. Um, which is a wonderful thing. That means more kids are leaving Newport Mesa with college credits already in their back pocket walking into um, four-year universities. Um, on top of that, I'm pleased to share with you that in addition to having all students, uh, you know, are increasing the, the, the number of all students, we have also increased and continue to increase the number of English learners that are taking um, AP classes. And that is a, a stated goal of ours to continue to have that number go up. In addition to that, we are monitoring the number of students with disabilities and trying to create pathways, encourage more students with disabilities to be able to gain uh, access to uh, AP classes. Um, while we had a dip uh, in the previous year, uh, we seek to continue the trend that we're currently on. And then as we've talked about several times tonight, um, our socioeconomically disadvantaged students are also um, having greater access to our AP courses. So with all of that, I would say probably my favorite slide that I'm gonna share with you is this one right here. So while we are increasing the number of students overall and increasing the number of students with disabilities, English learners, and students of poverty. Given all of that, the rates of students passing those AP tests are also going up, um, which is uh, pretty remarkable and a testament to the wonderful teachers and the wonderful kids that we have in those programs. So as we think about next steps uh, for our advanced placement uh, classes, we want to continue to increase access to students. Um, we want to work on uh, PD with our teachers to make sure that all kids that are going to be in that program are properly supported. We want to engage our community. It's important that our parents really know the advantage of what an AP class can do for a child. Um, so you know, working with groups like DLAC to have parents really understand the impact that that can have on their, on their education. And then, of course, celebrate the success of the wonderful things that are, are AP teachers and um, our AP students are doing. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Dr. Shaka. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. So as we close, this is our final slide, and we just wanted to go full circle and share really our process of utilizing data. As you can see right here, data plays a central role in progress monitoring, as we discussed, looking at that real-time um, actionable data. Um, Program valuation, how do we, how do we evaluate the uh, programs that we offer and always make decisions on resource allocation, how we prioritize that based off of data so ultimately we can put our resources where they need to be, we can make adjustments in real time, and we can examine um, the success metrics that matter most to us. So with that, we'd like to open up to any questions you might have, and thank you. Yes, um, Trustee Anderson, Barto, and then Weigand. Thank you. I have a couple of questions. Um, the one thing I was wondering is if it was possible um, to add to this um, for the trustees perhaps and include the 2018-19 or 19-20. It's hard to gauge when it's COVID time and now. So just I think that would be helpful for each of these bar graphs um, and clarifying I think for all of us. Um, and then... I really like this matrix, great. Um, I love to see those. I was wondering about the second column where it talks about the actions. Um, and I see at the bottom it says site level decisions. Um, but are there some commonalities? How is there a specific reason why that column is blank? A absolutely. So if you look at the interaction between um, column two and the first half of column three, mm -hmm. uh, Column two is designed to be, I'm just gonna say fillable by the sites because um, sometimes it's unique site-led 
actions that are designed to speak to both the district side of column three, and then if you look at the what would be your left side of column three, uh, each site might have other progress monitoring metrics that they feel are predictive of, of influence on that column four. So um, that's a very long way of saying column two is designed to be um, unique and fillable to each site based off of what actions um, our, our team thinks will we'll get the most bang for buck. Okay, I, I guess I'm just wondering if there are some though that we could um, have across the system. I think we're trying to work on a, a systemic approach, particularly the one that stood out to me is the college and career ready because the site section for that is blank. So if the site doesn't necessarily have, you know, three things that they're working on um, to, to measure, then we, we're kind of under-informed about what the actions are. I think those all work together. So I think just particularly that, like I don't know if, if one school is trying to get 15% more students to be in CTE next year, if we're not tracking it, we're not gonna get there and we're not gonna know necessarily. Although I know, I, I know you were the master with charts. Um, so <laughs> I remember seeing it in your office back in the day. So um, yeah, I just was wondering kind of if there was more information or it just wasn't on here. A a absolutely, and, and part of it is not all the information's on there because you know, we, we manipulate that. Um, it, it really, it truly is a, a living, um, evolving document. But I, I, I agree wholeheartedly and, and appreciate the point of the more alignment we can get with district-wide supports um, and district-wide actions is, is a good thing in the direction we wanna continue going. Okay, thank you. Um, I was excited to hear that we may be initiating more AVID at elementary schools. Um, I know that that was a massive change at Ray and had a lot of conversations involved. Um, are we thinking there's going to be possibly like one per high school zone? Is it if the principal is trained in AVID, if 60% of the teachers are trained in AVID. What, how will we determine? And are we at doing this one point, a year? It, or? At this point, it's exploratory. So sites that are interested are welcome, and sites are coming on board, going to the first conference. Keith's been able to set up visits, so they're going to see it in other spaces. Part of it is just kind of bringing down the mystery of mm -hmm. what does that mean, what happens. Being able to, we're setting up, like going to be able to visit Ray Avid Night, so you understand what that is, and kind of make it real and attainable. Mm -hmm. And so far, we've had a lot of interest from elementary <clears throat> schools. We'll continue to support any school with interest. It's happening across the district. It's no particular zone. And some places are, are interested, but just kind of needed a year to get there, right? So we're not forcing people to go at a pace that isn't comfortable for them. But I think it's becoming very inviting to explore more and bring it on. And teachers, I, I don't, and Keith can say more to this, but all the elementary teachers and sites that have gone have come back very excited very, to see what's next and what pacing feels good with all the other things that are happening in the district, how that really becomes embedded to the culture of who they are and what they do in the classrooms. Wonderful, thank you. Yeah, I think, I mean, even one or two avid strategies, right? Every school could start seeing those implemented and go from there. Um, I was wondering, the um, Asantia Newcomer Algebra pilot chart has the percentage of ELs, but then next to it is the percentage of newcomers. Is Could we get that information for each? So like, what does it look like um, for, one is for 2022, one is for 23, it's kind of, so, so yeah, so I, I, I can appreciate how that looks a little confusing. Um, part of the reason why the data is run that way is that uh, a significant number of the students that are currently in that class have just recently uh, arrived in the country and were not present to take assessments last year. And so just as a, as a manner to demonstrate the progress that those kids are making, um, we decided to just include the number of ELs. That being said, the students that were included in that, um, I would be happy to get that for you. Yeah, and just the number. I think I'm always interested in the number rather than the percent or okay. both. 
book? It's just because I don't know. Is that like 20 kids? Is it 200 that class, kids? It, yeah, yeah, it's a small class. It's in the 20s. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, I have just a few more. Um, for the next steps with newcomer, newcomer pilot, um, if replicating the successful instructional practices, um, do we have any kind of conversation or are we considering possibly expanding dual immersion programs, particularly for feeder elementary schools or programs that go into Estancia? I'm going to let, uh, I'll let Dr. Torres or Ms. Torres answer that question. Um, the, to the, um, the piece about the instructional strategies, um, there's a lot of work being done around having kids use language to kind of talk out their math. And so one of the things that you'll see in that class is that rather than having students sit at their desk, they are up and it's, the teacher has whiteboards all around the room and they're solving problems, kind of working very collaboratively. And so it's strategies like that. It is important to note that the goal of the algebra class is to not necessarily continue the instruction um, in years to come in Spanish. The goal would be to graduate to being able to um, be successful in uh, a, an algebra or, or excuse me, a geometry or an algebra two class that would be in English. So one of the pieces that's, a, that's being done in that class um, is working with our EL team so that the teacher is infusing um, ELD, integrated ELD strategies so the kids are simultaneously acquiring the math and the language. Um, but as for the, the dual immersion piece, I'll let um, Socorro speak to that. Yeah, I don't know that we're exploring other dual immersion schools at this time, although we're certainly fortifying Whittier and the pathways at Whittier to Ensign to Harbor in Spanish and College Park to Costa Mesa Middle and High in Mandarin. But I think what we're recognizing is the role of heritage language, the ways in which heritage language can be formally and informally recognized in the classroom, in instruction, in service to mastery in English. And so that's not that's in those language classes, it's in content classes, it's across the board, and it's a level of confidence for the speakers, particularly newcomers who many do come with content knowledge in another language. So really using that as an asset and building on assets. So I don't know that it's a formalized program, particularly because these newcomers are coming to us post our elementary version of dual immersion, but meeting them where they're at and recognizing the language ability and building it into the content areas is where we're continuing to explore, as they mentioned. And uh, the experience at Estancia has really been both successful for the students and the staff, but I think for the department as a program mode for something we can explore and develop more of. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, moving around and doing interactive things is a key instructional practice, but I think the newcomer pilot helps speak to the fact that learning in two languages when you have both languages is a really helpful thing. Um, and I think I'm glad that we're doing the heritage languages. However, we're doing that at Ray and Victoria, and so we're not necessarily, a lot of Ray kids go to Ensign and Newport Harbor. There's some Victoria kids that go to Estancia. A lot of them are transferring to a variety of our other high schools. So I just, I'll, again, like for particularly the elementaries and T. Winkle, and I think we're getting a lot of newcomer students at T. Winkle as well. I just think it's important to be mindful that we're not only target. I think we sometimes only target at the high school level when middle school is also really important. Um, we know that's a key strategy. I just have a few more. Um, I think for the next steps for Algebra 1, um, talking to sixth graders and eighth graders when they're taking the tests. It's similar to what Brianna was saying about Newport Harbor, you know, giving the kids snacks and pumping them up to take their 11th grade SBACs and all of those. Um, I've, I've worked with several sixth graders and eighth graders who are great at math and don't have a lot of parental support and they just blow the tests off. And so my concern is we're not necessarily getting accurate results for how high some of those students could be. Um, and so I think including kind of more, I love that we're starting to think more about community engagement around math. Um, but I, I just want to make sure too that like, particularly as we're thinking of summer, 
we can work with some of our nonprofit partners and some of our other organizations to really include and embed some of that in parent conversations, like why it's important, the day that it's happening. There's a lot of mystery around like, is it happening next Tuesday? Is it happening in May? No one knows, you know what I mean? Like lots of people don't know when those tests are, so they can't help their child necessarily, um, even if they would want to. Um, and for the AP enrollment, I'm glad to see those numbers um, dramatically, well, increase a bit. Um, to me, 67 still seems a bit low. Um, and so I was just wondering if w when we're like the counselors, the way that they're speaking about it, are they talking about it in the way, you know, you need to get a three on this test. You need to, we, you know, we don't want to drag down the average. Are we, are we letting kids who maybe are excellent at one of the AP classes, but are still working on their language, but the content is what they need? Are we including them? What is that process? Yeah, great question. Uh, so, you know, with the English learner in particular, you can imagine if you haven't necessarily yet reclassified, you still have significant language needs. However, that doesn't necessarily mean that that should preclude you from um, being able to access an AP class. Um, a lot of our AP classes are very language heavy. Um, you know, you hear about students having to write DBQs and, you know, really long essays, which can be um, difficult. And so it's what, what we are doing is um, identifying where students have been successful and if there are AP uh, classes that perhaps um, would, meet, would be more approachable that we would be able to encourage student participation there. Um, and then part of it is kind of what you've described, um, just the communication that we give to um, uh, to families and to students. So um, historically, you know, many many years ago, you know, there was a lot of barriers in order to, in order to access an AP class. And so we've been really clear and um, with our with our staff and our counselor to say that we want to remove those barriers. And if and if families or students want access to it, and even if it means that an English learner wants to be able to get in, you know, access an AP course that might be a bit of a challenge, um, but they want to push themselves, that we want to provide that opportunity. So it's a combination of looking at, you know, what, what does make sense because we want students to be successful, but also not necessarily putting reins on students unnecessarily. Awesome. Thank you. That is all. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Trustee Bartow, Wygand, and then Ersoilu, you can go after that, and Murphy. Okay. <laughs> I have three quick questions. Uh, one was just actually a thank you. Um, I love one that, for the, thank you for the transparent stats. I, we always like to see everything like a rosy picture all around, but it was nice to see, you know, where we can grow and also where we've succeeded. So I really appreciate that. Um, it looks like exclusively our increase in APs are from our low socioeconomic students and our English language learners just by the numbers. Between in the last three years, it's gone up about 400, and that is the socioeconomic status plus the EL is 403 or something. Um, so is that part of an like, are we making efforts in those directions? Um, I think that's really great because obviously those are the students who are least likely to take those courses, but I was just wondering if it was um, efforts specifically that we're targeting or if it was um, just, you know, other environmental factors. So I think th there's probably a number of factors that play into that. Um, one of those factors, um, I will I'll kind of harken back to an AVID program. Um, so you saw the number of students taking um, in the enrolled in the AVID program in Newport Harbor increasing significantly, and then also um, at Costa Mesa, Estancia. Um, one of kind of the hallmarks of AVID is to that students are enrolled in AP courses while they're in high school. Um, while I was in the 11th grade AVID uh, class today at um, Costa Mesa, I asked the kids that were sitting there, hey, how many of you guys are enrolled in an AP class? And you know, every student, uh, student at that table uh, raised their hand and I asked them, how many are you taking? And, and all of them actually were doubled up. Yeah. And so um, really it's kind of that raising the bar. And, and I'm not just gonna say that it was necessarily the AVID program, but I think that is a, certainly a contributor. But it's also how we communicate about AP. And you know, and kind of speaks to the, uh, to the piece that I was you know, kind of answering Trustee Anderson's question. Um, really communicating with our, with our team, with our counselors to say, we wanna push more kids and give them the ability to do that because there's no correlation between you know how much money your parents make and your ability to achieve academically and really stripping that away and kind of uh, letting kids go for it. That's 
Awesome, thank you. And my last question was just on the algebra pilot. Um, the slide was a little confusing because I wasn't sure if it was the average GPA at Estancia, column one, and then English language learners, number two, and then is the third all students in that pilot, or was it, it looked like it was those passing had that GPA, so would that be, did we take out the ones who weren't passing, or how does that? Yeah, good question, thank you for that. So you're correct on the first two columns. Again, it was seeking to be like a representative sample of kind of where the students are at. That third column does just represent the students, and it is, I think, 87% of those kids. Um, so we had isolated those out for the purpose of kind of saying, like, what is what is so special about these kids, right. and how can we try to replicate it? Yeah. Um, but if you wanna see the, the numbers for the handful of kids that were not included in that data set, I'd be happy to give that yeah, to thank you. you. I mean, it's such a small sample size that I feel like it's going to be skewed anyway, but I'd love to like kind of see. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Trustee Weigand. Thank you. Um, kind of piggybacking on um, Trustee Barto's question, you have in here that it says um, increased access to students, so making it to expand equitable access for AP classes, does that mean offering um, a, the same AP classes at every school site, um, or what does that what does what does that really mean? So it speaks to that piece of the kind of we've mentioned a few times before, ensuring that that all students would have access to um, the AP classes. Um, right now, we're not necessarily looking to try to you know replicate AP at the same AP classes at all of the campus campuses because it really kind of is driven by student need, mm -hmm. um, and so um, that could be perhaps a consideration in the future. But that line in the in the slides is more reference to the work that we're doing to kind of strip away the red tape. Uh, for students to be able to access it. And any principal can ask for any section of any course based upon student um, interest. And so at times you'll see that there are some courses that aren't offered everywhere because we don't have enough students to run a section. AP Chemistry is one of them. Sometimes you just don't get a, a group of kids who want to, to embark on that. But every principal yeah. talks to us and says, this is what we need and we build it. If there's a student um, that wants to take an AP class that's not offered at, say, their school, can they go and take it at another school, or do we do we allow that? Okay. We would allow that. Um, we have some concurrent, we call that concurrent enrollment, and we do have opportunity for that. Okay. That's awesome. Good. Thank that's you. Really good. That's all. Um, Hi. This is awesome. I have so many questions, I'm going to try to limit it. Um, the... First question, the AVID in elementary, what is that? Can someone just give me like a quick explanation? That's just incorporating strategies into the teaching. It's not taking away from any content teaching time, right? Right, it's okay. embedded in the instructional day. Okay, cool. And it is some extra activities, like it really is about teachers embracing a college going culture. So mm -hmm. the adopting of a, a college by making it very real, like that school, life doesn't stop at the end of 12th grade, that there are these pathways after and a real intentional effort to kind of clarify that and make it very visible and illuminate that for families and students. Like college night at Ray. It just makes it, yes, yeah. attainable. And demystified. Do we have models of like other districts that have done this and seen college entry rates go up as a result of the yes. involvement in elementary? Yeah, so thank you for the question. Um, so one thing you said in the question was, is it kind of equipping strategies and ensuring you know best practices is what I think you were alluding to. And that's really the heart of what it would be at the elementary level. Um, and so kind of we referred to a couple times the alignment or coherence around school systems or learning systems. So rather than um, you know stopping the learning and, and doing something different for a period of time, um, AVID at the elementary level is really designed to be a framework uh, for teaching and learning. And so what it uh, seeks to do is to equip teachers with the very very best instructional strategies according to research and practice and data and history and m ensure alignment across grade levels and across systems. So when we talk about, you know, uh, elementary school and middle school and a high school, that um, the learning systems, the note taking systems, the organizational systems, how we're teaching reading, how we're teaching writing, that all of those would have uh, similarities. And so kind of classically what we say is that it shouldn't be a student's responsibility to relearn how to learn every single year, that we as the adults in the system should be able to come together and build what is kind of a, a strong system for those kids. Mm -hmm. no, that makes sense, thank you. The, um, 
is it possible, like at another date, not today, but to get a chart that shows the AP pass rate, but by SES and um, English language and disability? Because it's great that more low-income yes. kids are taking it, but I, it kind of means nothing if I don't know who's actually passing it. Are they passing it at the same rate, close to the same rate? How's that looking? Yeah. Um, so that would be really great. Get later. that data for you. Another day. Not yeah, that's fine. And then um, the algebra pilot is awesome, and I have, like, too many questions, so I don't want to waste people's time. I guess my real question is how many newcomers are there and how did they opt into this program? You said about 20, but are there only 20 newcomers there or are there like 40 and they had to choose to be in? The, how did the selection happen? So great question. Uh, so the newcomers that are in that class are the newcomers that are that would be taking Algebra 1. Um, so if you're a newcomer that either has already taken Algebra 1 or um, perhaps is not grade level appropriate. Um, and then when we selected the students for the class, we offered that as an option. And we said to those families, if you would like to be able to, to take this, um, you, you can do that. And um, all, nearly all of them did. Um, but we still wanted to ensure that those families still also had the right uh, to be able to go into a traditional algebra course um, if they wanted to do that as well. Um, when we communicated with the families about this pilot, about this program, um, naturally a lot of the families uh, identified that that would probably be a wise choice for their students, um, but I can give you the exact numbers in terms of um, how many students are in there and how many students opted to not uh, take that course. Okay, yeah, just trying to figure out um we offered it to all, and then they got to make the choice. Most of them chose. Okay. And then um, is there a plan to expand it to, are there like a substantial amount of newcomers at Twinkle in eighth grade? And is there a plan to expand it to math? Because just seeing the boost in their confidence when they pass it and the fact that it's really spreading to their whole GPA is really exciting potentially, but it probably should happen earlier, like seventh, eighth with the math. Yeah. Um, to boost their confidence in learning overall. Um, is there any plan for that, or is there not enough newcomers in Tewinkle? So all of those questions are the questions we're, we're kind of engaged in asking ourselves and evaluating what makes sense. Um, you know, a, a newcomer population could be, it could be a different group of students when they're in middle school because, you know, some of these students are literally just arriving to us, you know, this school year. Um, and so it's looking at where those students are and how we can best serve them. We started with this, um, quite frankly, because uh, Principal Halt um, had a vision for what this would look like and he's such a strong instructional leader um, that we knew that the support behind it and he identified some really strong teachers would be a great place to start. And so um, we're looking at the success we're experiencing there and kind of talking strategically about how we can replicate that in a thoughtful manner, not necessarily just doing it and then not being able to replicate some of the really strong pieces that are in place. Mm -hmm. And just one last question. What percent of like the instruction is in Spanish? So it started, it started the year 100% um, in Spanish. Um, I would say if you were to go into that classroom right now, it's still probably at least north of 50 to 75%. Um, but again, mind you, these are, are students that are newer to the country. Our goal is from this point going forward, and we have um, our English learner team working with the math teachers to transition towards um, includes, inclusion of more English. Um, but there is still a significant amount of Spanish being spoken. Um, but to the point that Socorro was making earlier, um, one of the, the best outcomes is the empowerment that those students feel. Um, the students are alive as you walk into that class. Yeah, no, that's incredible. And I think expanding it to the English language learners at Teamwinkle, just seeing that that's a, a lower Right, um, whatever you can do to make that happen um, in some way that makes sense seems really positive because of the way it's impacting their full GPA. So thank you for all thank your work. You. Absolutely. Really thank great. You. Trustee Murphy? All of my questions have been <laughs> asked. <laughs> <laughs> all right. They um, had two hours of questions for the planning commission. <laughs> so when I ask a lot of questions, I still don't feel that bad. <laughs> I have, I have two questions. Uh, the slide on graduation rate, all students. Uh, which, how many of our students that are graduating at 97 percentile are AG ready? Do we have that number? And if not, it's, you can just 
we, we do have that number, and it and it kind of um, bounces up and down each year. I believe this last year was right about 64 okay. percent of our students were were uh, A to G eligible. Um, we're normally in that mid 60s, so don't hold me to exactly that number. It might be 63 point something, but it was right about 64 okay. percent. And we can measure that by school as well. So we have a district number a metric, and then we have a school metric. Okay, that's great. And then um, graduation rate student groups. What are the percentages of the general population of our d secondary kids? Are English learners low income and student with disabilities? So let me make sure I'm understanding that. Uh, okay, so if you look at the student groups that are represented in this statistic, the English learners are, represent what percentage of our total student population in the secondary or in, within that that pool that you. Got it. What number? So I, I can I can do that math um, and, and get it for you. Uh, you. You can see it's 115 kids in 2020 were English learners, down to 105. So I, I can back that out of a you know, some I think our graduating class is somewhere around 12 or 1300 students. Um, so. Okay. Come on, do the math. 9%? <laughs> <laughs> Is that close? <laughs> well, I, I just, I love the fostering that can-do culture because I think it is contagious. And as several trustees have pointed out, it's like if you believe in the child and give them the opportunity, that child will seize that opportunity. And especially if the culture is encouraging it. So, and we can tell by the results. So keep it up. That's wonderful. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Okay, then we'll, we will move on. Thank you so much to um, the report from the Citizens Oversight Committee um, and receive the Measure F 2022-23 Financial and Performance Audits. Assistant Superintendent Trader. So the board has um, appointed some really great uh, community members, they're stellar, and I'd like to introduce to you Despina Casa. She is the chair of the Citizens Oversight Committee. Awesome. Welcome. Thank you. Um, good evening, members of the NMUSD board. My name is Despina Carassa, and I'm the new chair of the Citizens Oversight Committee. I'm a current resident of Costa Mesa with three young children, one currently enrolled in Davis, and the other two will follow him over the years. Uh, a little background on myself. I have been a volunteer PTA treasurer in the district. I currently sit on the school site council for Davis. And then prior to moving to Costa Mesa, I was president for several years of a Granada Hills Chamber of Commerce up in LA. And then before that, I worked at Lazard Asset Management in New York. And then before all of that, <laughs> I actually worked in theater for the Gersh Agency, representing writers, directors, set designers, costume designers, lighting designers. So when this came up, I was like, yay, pick me. <laughs> um, <laughs> and my husband's like, why? I'm like, I couldn't say no. Um, so tonight, I'm here to present on behalf of the COC committee the following report to the Board of Education as required by Resolution 14-10-16. The COC is charged with ensuring to the community that the expenditure of bond, bond monies authorized by the voters is consistent with the purposes approved by the voters in November 2005. Oversight means just that, reviewing what the district is doing with the Measure F bond proceeds to make sure what is being done is what the voters authorized. Specifically, the COC is charged by law with the following, to ensure expenditures are consistent with the voter approved authorization, to review the annual independent financial audit, to review the annual independent performance audit, to review the planning, scheduling, and budgeting of the projects funded by the bond proceeds, and to represent the interests of the community through participation and advice. Over the past year, the committee has met quarterly to review expenditures associated with the construction of the Estancia Theater. On February 26, 2024, the committee reviewed the draft 2022-23 Measure F Financial and Performance Audits with Christy White, the district's independent auditor. The associated audit documents are attached to the board agenda item. As of June 30th, 2023, total Measure F general obligation bond assets totaled $27,214,254. The auditor expressed an unmodified opinion of the financial statements and issued no findings. In addition, internal controls over financial reporting and compliance with laws were tested. The auditor determined through inquiry of management and evaluation of district processes that no significant deficiencies were noted. The auditor also conducted a performance audit to determine the district's compliance with Proposition 39. This audit included testing of facility project expenditures, personnel expenditures, contract bidding procedures, and contract change order procedures. There were no findings or recommendations related to this audit. 
In summary, I'm happy to report the Measure F audits were without any findings and or recommendations. The committee looks forward to donning hard hats on our visit to Estancia Theatre construction site at our next meeting on May 6th, and we express our appreciation for the opportunity to serve the board and the community in this oversight capacity and look forward to apprising the board of activities in the future. Excellent. Thank you. You're welcome. Wonder a, a wonderful start to your <laughs> chairmanship. Oh, thank so you. So good job. <laughs> it's a great project, so it's been great. Thank you for your time. Uh, we now move on to consent calendar. Trustees, do we have a motion to adopt? So moved. I'll Trust second. I Trustee Bartow, second. All right. Bartow or Anderson Bartow? Oh. It's a tie. Um, Trust, uh, Trustee Wigand moved it, and Trustee Bartow seconded. Are there any, are there any questions? Um, should we, do we, yeah, go ahead, Trustee Anderson. Thank you. Um, uh, for number 19A1. 19A1. Um, to approve the updated transportation service plan under the California Ed Code. Um, I had emailed to pull this item um, because the um, some of the safe routes to school information is outdated. Um, some of them are from 2010. Some of them have locations and directions that are not necessarily the most safe. Um, one that comes to mind was the College Park um, map, which now has the Hawk signal at Wilson Park, and it's a totally different process. Um, for a lot of the kids to get to school, it didn't even have avocado, which is where 60% of the kids probably at College Park um, come from. Um, so, And then there's also two board policies that are part of that plan, um, and two have not been updated since 2009. So I had requested that we bring it back to our policy team to go over those two policies specifically. Um, and there's some other information in there that isn't necessarily accurate um, or I guess not accurate, I would say up to date and as relevant as we would want it to be. Um, but Mr. Trader has let me know that um, we are able to make changes. So we are accepting it and improving it. But next week, next month, we can change and make those um, updates. And then also to one of the reasons I was at the planning commission meeting for a very long time, um, the city is going to be updating the safe routes to school um, action plan. So that will be their starting this summer. They have an RFP that's going out and that will take a year. So um, we may not get new information, but I think for our families, even if we're not using the city's map, we need up to date and the most safe routes to school that may be slightly different from the existing ones that are on the city website. So just I'm concerned if there's a student accident or something and we're instructing people to go the wrong way. Um, so I'm going to approve it, but also have a variety of changes. So thank you, Mr. Trader. Um, and then just one other thing, I was very excited. 19A10, we are finally using the Irvine Company money to update the NPRs, put the audio visual. I was at Victoria Elementary seeing Beauty of the Beast and I could <laughs> barely hear and it will be very exciting to have microphones. Um, so thank you very much for adding that one on. That's it. Thank you for your comments, Trustee Anderson. All right, so let's have a roll call vote. Trustee Crane? Yes. Trustee Wigan? Yes. Trustee Soilu? Yes. Trustee Bartow? Yes. Trustee Murphy? Yes. Trustee Pearson? Yes. Trustee Anderson? Yes. Thank you. The votes are seven, eight yeses and no noes. Thank you. Let's move on to item 20, which is public hearing action calendar. Uh, item 20A is public hearing of the California School Employees Association, chapter number 18, initial proposal for contract reopeners to the Newport Mesa Unified School District for negotiations commencing 2024. And uh, Assistant Superintendent Olson. Thank you. Well, you, um, you have heard it said a couple times tonight from Dr. Smith and from Amy Chang, our um, president of CSEA, that tonight is we are sunshining. And so for those who are not familiar with that term or the process, sunshining is the first step. And really, it just means that 
we are sharing with the public and with the board the articles that will be negotiated. For CS CSEA negotiations this year, uh, for the 24-25 school year, this is a reopener, meaning that each um, party can open up two articles as well as wages and health and welfare benefits. So with that, um, it would ask the board to hold a public hearing um, on the initial proposal for CSEA's Sunshine document. All right, so the hearing is now open at 8.04. Are there any public comments? Seeing none, we will now close the hearing at 8.04. <laughs> Uh, let's move on to 20B, which is Receive California School Employees Association Chapter Number 18, Initial Proposal for Contract Reopener to the Newport Mesa Unified School District for Negotiations Commencing 2024. Assistant Superintendent Olson. Yes, so at this point we would ask that you would receive CSEA's um, Initial Proposal for Reopeners. Uh, trustees, have a motion? So moved. Second. Second. All right, moved by Trustee Wygant and seconded by Trustee Anderson. Roll call vote, please. Trustee Crane? Yes. Trustee Wygant? Yes. Trustee Soilu? Yes. Trustee Bartow? Yes. Trustee Murphy? Yes. Trustee Pearson? Yes. Trustee Anderson? Yes. The motion passes 7-0. Let's move on to 20C, which says, public hearing of the Newport Mesa Unified School District's initial proposal for contract reopeners to the California School Employees Association, chapter number 18, for negotiations commencing 2024. Ms. Olson. Thank you. So this is the document, the initial proposals for reopeners with, um, on behalf of the district. I do want to share with the board and the public, the board has received an updated document um, we had over-identified um, articles for um, the reopeners, but so we are, the new document, the updated document is we are withdrawing the article eight, which is leaves. And so you have that in front of you. And for the public, um, Dr. Brown has extra copies of the new document if anybody would like a copy that she can pass out to you now. So we would ask the board to hold the public meeting on the district's initial proposals for um, negotiations with CSEA. Anyone needs the sheet of paper that Dr. Brown is so willingly <laughs> wanting to give away? All right, so we the hearing is now open at 8.06. Are there any public comments? Seeing there are none, we will close the hearing at 8.06, actually 8.07, although it took less than a minute. Um, <laughs> hearing is closed. Now we would like to approve Newport Mesa Unified School District's initial proposal for contract reopeners to the California School Employees Association, chapter number 18, for negotiations commencing 2024. Uh, do I have a motion? So move. Second. Was, who was the second? Was that Trisha? Lisa. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Moved by Trustee Wygan, seconded by Trustee Pearson. Roll call vote, please. Trustee Crane? Yes. Trustee Wigan? Yes. Trustee Soilu? Yes. Trustee Bartow? Yes. Trustee Murphy? Yes. Trustee Pearson? Yes. Trustee Anderson? Yes. The motion passes 7-0. Let's move on to discussion action calendar, item 21A, and that is to approve elementary science textbook adoption. Dr. Sir? Yes, thank you. So I'm excited to have uh, Dr. Lori Hernandez and Michelle Hans come with us uh, this evening. Uh, tonight we're bringing to you a recommendation for uh, science materials uh, with a program that is called Elevate Science. Last year we had an opportunity to bring together a large number of Newport Mesa educators and uh, look at all the different options that are out there, all the different programs that are out there. They were able to bring it down to two specific programs and we have our recommendation for you to Tonight, I'll turn it over to Dr. Hernandez. How do I get the screen? Can you touch the computer? The, it's on my screen, but oh. how do I get it up there? We get the oh, screen to work? Yeah. It just woke up. Okay. okay. All right. Good evening, President Crane, members of the board, Superintendent Smith, staff, and guests. Tonight, I will provide some background information about our recommendation for the board to approve our science instructional materials. 
So currently in our classrooms, we have Pearson Science. That's our approved curriculum. It's been in classrooms for about 15 years. So it is definitely time for an update. The standards were updated in 2013 and the fr a new framework was approved in 2016. And so we have teachers currently using a program called Mystery Science and other NGSS lessons as supplements to the old textbooks, but it's definitely time for us to get a comprehensive curriculum aligned to our current standards. So the committee was uh, comprised of 21 teachers. Um, we also had some other um, specialists involved, special education teachers, we had um, TOSAs, but 21 classroom teachers became part of the pilot. They were trained in NGSS, so this all started about a year ago. And then we looked at the state approved curriculum and narrowed down at first to four. We invited those companies in to do a presentation for us. We reviewed those materials, then narrowed it down to two, which was TWIG and SAW. Us elevate and we had two pilot cycles and on January 30th we met for a full day as a committee to come to consensus and I'm going to talk about those processes a little bit so during the pilot uh, that we had about six to eight weeks in each program so each for each cycle the parents in the classrooms are notified your child's classroom is part of a, a curriculum pilot they receive a letter with full access the teachers actually teach a full unit six to eight weeks and then as they are teaching they also are submitting lesson evaluation forms and we evaluated on overall science content, 3D design, instructional supports, monitoring students in student instruction, hands-on inquiry-based instruction, and technology resources. The data from these lesson evaluations was analyzed by the committee as part of the consensus process. So on January 30th, we had collaborative discussions. We weighed pros and cons. We had teachers work in grade level groups and in mixed groups. And Savas California Elevate was chosen by the committee as the recommended curriculum for K-6 with a commitment to convene a separate group to talk about TK. This summer, there are new TK foundations or standards coming out. And so a lot of the publishers don't quite have their TK curriculum fully developed. Or if it is, um, you know, we are gonna hold off a minute because we currently have an integrated program in TK where kids are getting science and social studies as part of their core. But um, with this curriculum adoption, we're gonna wait and convene a TK committee to make that decision about science. And um, I'm now going to introduce Michelle Hanscom. She's a second grade teacher at College Park. She was one of our pilot teachers, and um, she's going to share some information about the curriculum we're proposing. Thank you, Superintendent uh, Mr. Smith, um, President Crane, and board members. Um, I'm happy to report um, back from our pilot committee that we loved Savas. Um, the teachers and students love that consumable format that it comes in, as you can see up on the screen. Um, the lessons that we taught were 100% aligned to the NGSS California Science Standards, which are great, um, finally, to have that as a teacher. Um, the activities are engaging. They're hands-on. There's project-based learning quests that you can see on the far right. And those are authentic activities that span the entire unit of study and incorporates everything that they have learned into one project at the very end. So not only do we have hands-on activities throughout, we have one that spans the entire unit. The program also integrates very well with our language arts and our social studies curriculum. Um, Savas Elevate has a great online platform. It is really easy to use. Um, it enhances the print materials that we have in the consumable format as well as what we can display online as a teacher. It also has a digital text that can be read to students, so if you are assigning assignments. It has numerous supplements. It has virtual labs, models, and videos to enhance all of our instruction. The content um, has online support and it's continuous and the feedback is immediate from the company, which was really important um, in responsive when we needed help and couldn't find something as a teacher. And it's also accessible to both teachers and students via ClassLink. Savas offers open hands-on learning investigations. They're easy to set up. 30-second lab setup, it has a mat to go with it, and it's really quick as a teacher. 
It's engaging, and the investigations also promote collaborative and student-centered learning. There are also a variety of assessments, quiz quizzes, and benchmark assessments. There are also hands-on performance-based assessments as well. They can all be modified to be differentiated for all students as needed, and some are even auto-graded, which is nice. <laughs> Last month, the board approved Savas Elevate for public display, as you know. Um, so comments included a lot of positive feedback, questions. Um, a few parents, I think, uh, misunderstood. Our review was digital. We did have hard copies available, so parents could either come in, make an appointment, see the hard copies, but all of the student texts were fully available digitally, and so some parents commented that they didn't want digital text, they wanted actual oh. books for kids, and so that's, that happened on our last review as well. Um, so as you can see, the textbook is an actual book for students. So kids can actually like do their reading, their activities, and actually write in the book, and then every year there's a new copy of the textbook. So it's a little different format. A lot of our curriculum are coming in consumable format now. So um, There are four segments, so this isn't just one. Yeah, that's not it. Every unit is its own little book, which is actually really helpful. Um, and then it can be, you know, sent home or kept for grading or open house. And um, we had, you know, a comment about the content of the curriculum. And so just to be clear, you know, we are a public school and it does have to be based on our state standards, the, the NGSS standards. So uh, the, this program is adopted by the state and does meet the standards. So the next step is uh, tonight we ask for your approval of Elevate Science as our instructional materials adoption for K-6. And just to understand the timeline, I, I know I'm standing up in front of you often with new curriculum requests because we just adopted our history social science curriculum. We are looking to implement this over a two year period because we also have math coming to you. We're in the middle of a math pilot. And so we, we understand that's a lot of change for teachers, but we also understand the need to update curriculum and have current high quality materials in classrooms. So we are gonna do a two year implementation. So for science, there is a lot of training that needs to happen because the standards changed and the method the methodology changed. And so we are going to be providing materials to all classrooms, but allowing them to still access those lessons that they've been using for NGSS. So we have a crossover year. And then we're gonna continue to provide training. So we'll have trainings starting this spring, then in the summer, and then throughout next school year as we have a crossover year. And then in the 25-26 school year, it will be full implementation with required district training. Because for this next coming school year, our required district training will be math. And so we only have so much actual required PD time and PD days. And so we have, um, based on teacher feedback and just pacing out our adoptions, we've decided to do a two-year implementation model. And so next year it will be, we will have the textbooks and all of that, but we will have the other curriculum is still available to teachers. And then our science specialists are gonna be implementing Project Lead the Way. So this program, just to be clear, we do have science specialists at all of our elementary schools, and they teach an hour of science a week to kids, um, and, and every other week for, for the younger kids. And so our science specialists are still there, they're credentialed science teachers. They're gonna actually be doing Project Lead the Way modules, engineering modules that are NGSS aligned that will enhance the curriculum that kids are getting in their core program. So science is, you know, has always been taught also in the multiple subject classroom. We've been lucky enough to have science specialists and um, kind of piecemeal together a, a curriculum between the science specialist and the classroom teacher. So now it will be really clear where this will be the curriculum for the core classroom teacher for all students, and then they will also, everyone will have Project Lead the Way engineering modules when they go to the lab. So we think it's gonna be a really, um, a really nice change and a really exciting for the kids to get those opportunities. Um, the kits that we are implementing also, this curriculum also comes with hands-on kits for each classroom. So there are um, experiments and hands-on learning that is tied to the standards of the grade level, but not designed to be done in a lab. So really things that teachers can actually do inside their classrooms. So at this time, we, we open up for questions. Trustee Wigand and Bartow. 
Um, yes, thank you. This is really exciting because I, I do hear from parents that, you know, sci that kids are excited about science, but once they get into their science lab, they get a little bored or there's a lot of videos that they're watching. And, and so this, I think, is great that they will have sci uh, science instruction in their multi-subject classroom mm -hmm. by the teachers. And then when they're in the science mm -hmm. labs, they will have Project Lead the Way, which I think is what um, I've heard that, that kids and, and parents and I think teachers really would, would like. Um, I just wanted to say uh, thank you for um, adopting a curriculum that, um, yeah, after, yeah, in the next 15 years, but also been a while. goes to our, um, teaches to our, our, our standards mm -hmm. that we will be tested on. Um, yep. So that's really appropriate. Um, and that's it. I don't have really any questions. Just thank you. Yeah, we had um, actually we had the Project Lead the Way training is going on this week. So I want to also thank and acknowledge Diana Thompson. Um, she is in the audience. She's our um, teacher on special assignment for science. And so she's been with the specialists this week actually getting hands on trained in Project Lead the Way. And it's been really exciting for our teachers. Thank you. Uh, trustee, was it Bartor or and then Anderson? I don't know. Which I think I have it that way. Okay, I'll go. Um, thank you very much. I did go through the comments, and I would agree that a lot of the content, when you pick up the, national, the NGSS standards, this is probably one of the curriculums I've seen that's most rigorously tied mm -hmm. to the standards of anything I've reviewed. So um, I think that's good. And I know a lot of our sites have been kind of working piecemeal over the years. Um, mm -hmm. This will be my 10th year in the, as a parent in the district, 10th, completing their 10th school year. Mm -hmm. So I've seen kind of a range of how science can go um, when you've got a great teacher sometimes and sometimes when you don't and how that can vary. Um, I, I think guess my biggest concerns are, um, although it's very much tied to the standards, I just think that we I think we can do better than this. Um, I didn't see a lot of stuff on scientific method. Um, I see videos. Some of the projects actually were really cool. I thought they did a fair job talking about, I know that the energy can be controversial, but I thought they did a really good job, especially in sixth grade, of tying all those things together as a real world, world project to understand you know, the efficiency of different types and how you plan that. That was amazing. But what I don't see, and I think the kids would need more of, because there's so many kids who, um, that language arts and that social sciences, those pieces actually lose them. And science is one of the few places where they can kind of um, understand the world and get excited. I know personally one of my kids has a real big struggle with science, uh, with, with reading and with math. His motivation to do, well, two of them, their motivation to do well is science inspires them and they go, okay, I'll suffer through the, the lab that I have to handwrite because I know what I just learned was interesting or I'll learn to do the math mm -hmm. because that was ex engaging. And I just, I don't see that being tied in. I think, I not that I don't, but I just think that we could do even better mm -hmm. than we are. We're trying to set a really high bar. And then just lastly, I think it, we're trying to bring these AVID strategies into mm -hmm. elementary school, science, and again, not every year, and it's not district-wide, but when done well, can really bring a lot of that avid mindset into the classroom in just a sort of natural way. You're working together collaboratively. You're writing these lab books. Um, you're discovering. You're writing. You're thinking. Um, and I, I just think that a lot of times with kind of a consumable model like this, you learn, I lose a little bit of that. And I know it's got to be so much harder for teachers to implement that across the district with fidelity, but um, I just feel like we could raise the bar for ourselves a little bit higher. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Trustee Anderson. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, um, we I heard lab, and I, I know at one point we were talking about having a science lab at every elementary school, and I just wanted to double check that we have one. We do. We do now. Okay. We do, and that's where the Project Lead the Way engineering modules are going to be taking place. Wonderful. Um, and then um, I had actually a comment, but I also wanted to follow up a bit on what Trustee Bartow was saying. Um, will this model allow teachers kind of more flexibility. I know teachers learn, you know, science methods when they're in teacher mm -hmm. education programs. Is there more kind of flexibility so it's built in that they are teaching that or or the science specialists are teaching some of those kind of pieces that maybe are not included in a consumable? 
Yeah, our goal, so, the, so to be clear, the consumable is, is the text, and but there are also a, a lot of other materials and resources that it comes with. You know, there's re little readers about science concepts. There's hands -on, There's a hands-on kit for those hands-on activities. There's all this other stuff that comes with it. And one of the things to remember is that most of our teachers went through their science methods credentialing courses prior to this version of the standards. So when I was a teacher, even, the standards were completely different. And so... Um, um, we have to provide professional development and support with our teachers, which is why we're doing a two-year rollout so we can continue that conversation. And we're, we are planning on not just even two years of PD, but, you know, really continuing this conversation about how to teach science at, you know, at a really high level. And through that process, I mean, the first step is getting materials that are aligned. So now that we have materials that are aligned, then we hire the experts to train us on the best methods for teaching science. And we have to do that. And that's, that's going to be our next charge is to do that and then um, to evaluate the materials and say are there areas where we need to as a system kind of this component we can make stronger right but no material is going to you know meet our needs a hundred percent I've never done a curriculum adoption where it was like this is it a hundred percent there's always things that we want to continually evaluate but the getting the materials in the classrooms is really the first step but there will be ongoing teacher training Thank yeah. you so much. Mm -hmm. And I was very excited to see that you're here. I know curriculum is a passion of yours. I remember hearing some concerns that you had had in the past, so I'm really glad that you were part of this and used the word love. Um, <laughs> that is a big thing. I know yeah, that you were really wanting this, um, as well as the social studies curriculum. So thank you so much. Thank you. I, I was on the adoption many years ago for the curriculum that's now outdated and I was really excited to continue to join and and I sent my letter over to Diana and said can I please join and um, I'm really passionate about it um, the curriculum is a good stepping stone we need something and what we have is so outdated and so that's what makes it exciting um, it's it's limitless and what we can add as a district and enhance and so that's where Lori comes in with our professional development what we learned and what we trained on in NGSS prior to even looking at the materials was so thorough um, I'm ready to teach science in that next step so um, that's why we chose this as a pilot committee um, so we can enhance from it thank you so much thank you so in in a, in a classroom uh, the, the teacher has the, the prerogative to also add depth and complexity, right? Absolutely. So, that, so this is like the, the minimum, and mm -hmm. then given your classroom, then you can go that way mm -hmm. easy in science. So I'm, I'm, I'm assuming there are teachers that are so amazing will do that and add depth and complexity, mm -hmm. monitor, adjust, right? Absolutely. Okay, yes. good. Yes. Great. Thank you. I, I do like that you included the comments and everything. I appreciate that yeah. for transparency. Um, all right, so do we have a motion to adopt um, the, uh, approve the elementary science textbook adoption? So moved. Trustee Weigand, and a second? Second. Trustee Anderson, roll call vote, please. Student board member, Sailor Reddit. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Trustee Crane. Yes. Trustee Weigand? Yes. Trustee Rosoilu? Yes. Trustee Bartow? No. Trustee Murphy? Yes. Trustee Pearson? Yes. Trustee Anderson? Yes. And our student board member got to read the comments as well, so that was great. <laughs> okay. So we have six yeses, one no, and the vote carries. Thank you. All right, let's move on Thank to you. 21B. Approve the 2023. 2024 second period interim report of district's financial status. Mr. Trader. I have to say, you all are on fire tonight. Oh, we are so excited. <laughs> Questions. <laughs> I think, uh, if, if you're all out, that's okay. It won't hurt my feelings. So, um, uh, 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 uh. Let's go here. <laughs> all right, so let's uh, orient ourselves here just real quickly. Um, <clears throat> so, oh, sorry. I, this. We don't want to do this one again, do we? <laughs> Wrong <two>. one. <laughs> I would be like so bad. We had 50 minutes of that one. <laughs> we put a real spin on that. <laughs> did, I, did I ever tell you like uh, curriculum adoptions are very expensive? <laughs> Let's not do that one again. 
<laughs> all right, here we go. So it's required by law, and we're taking all of the transactions from the June adoption all the way up through second interim. And that period is November 1st through January 31st. And so it includes all the multi-year forecasts, and it certifies our ability to meet our obligations two years out. And so this is kind of where we're at in the financial cycle, so you can just kind of see where we're at. And here we are, second interim right there in March, and then we're rolling right into the 24-25 budget. And with that, um, <clears throat> oh, <excuse me. laughs> the state is, is having a problem. Mm -hmm. um, and it's gonna impact us. And it's an out year problem, it's not this year, it is next year, and we're in for some rough sailing. Mm -hmm. The state has a $73 billion deficit. And you might think, you might think, what? I mean, that's a whopper. And for, a, you know, we're, are we having a recession? No. Things seem to be going pretty well. And in fact, when you look at the actual revenues, they're about 3% above. So, so we're getting a, a positive 3% coming in. So then, what's happening? What is happening? And uh, I'll let you make your own conclusion there. <laughs> <laughs> the, the revenue estimates are really off. And so what's happening here and what, what we're looking at is there are some dis less disruptive things that the state can do and there's more disruptive things. So we're just dealing with disruptive. But, but we wanna stay in the, the less category. And <clears throat> the, what we're seeing is that normally when you come out of recession, you have a surge in revenues, right? We're not in a recession. So revenues aren't gonna save the day for the state. So that only leaves them one option, and that's the expenditures. And so and there's some things they can do. They can use the rainy day fund. They can reject new spending proposals. They can implement cash deferrals. The more disruptive stuff includes canceling the COLA, reducing allocations to existing programs. Let me tell you about that. Mm -hmm. Some of the things that I've heard that the legislature has their eyes on are uh, community schools, and uh, some of the, uh, yeah. uh, the existing program that would particularly hurt us would be uh, universal meals. And so we're really concerned about that. So as you're talking with your folks there, we want to protect universal meals if we can and community schools, those kinds of things. Um, and then they're talking about sweeping unallocated educational funds. So perhaps funds that, that we have already budgeted for They'll claw back. We're really concerned about that. And then also, this is one of the most toxic things that um, I've seen, and, and, and they've, they've proposed this before in the past unsuccessfully, but here it's alarming because it's coming up again. And that is what's called minimum state aid. And back in, uh, when we shifted to the LCFF, for, the LCFF formula, we had all these categorical programs, right? And we had this great idea, you know, let's, let's just get rid of all those programs, right? And do something more effective in terms of the LCFF formula. But in order to do that, they had to keep people like us, community funded districts, whole, because we weren't gonna get any of that anymore. And that was gonna come through the LCF formula to other districts that aren't community funded. And so that for us is about seven point six million dollars a year right now. And so we're, we're concerned about that. So if you're talking to your folks there, minimum state aid, very important to community funded districts and to Newport Mesa Unified. And so let's talk about um, the revisions that we have made. Revenue increased by about seven, uh, $7.7 .7 million. And you can see here that most of it, federal, this was mostly special ed, uh, we had a, a correction there in, in that revenue. Other local, um, this is uh, associated with um, a CalShape grant. So <clears throat> our MNO folks are gonna, they're applied for this CalShape grant. We're gonna put in these really cool um, 
things that do the air conditioning and, and it'll ramp up, you know, so we'll save all this money on, on electricity. That's kind of neat and I'm, I'm really kind of excited about that. And then we also get a lot more community support uh, at this time of year too, so that's kind of cool. And then um, other state, this is a lot of miscellaneous adjustments here with other state, lottery, those kinds of things. And then expenditures though, they increased just kind of slightly, about 1.3 million. So when we look at this, it's mostly staffing, non-staffing um, <clears throat> kinds of things, real plain vanilla stuff that we're used to at this time of year. Other financing uh, uses, and sources increased, and we're increasing transfers out by uh, $7 million. And then our ending fund balance is slightly decreased, uh, very little, it's pretty stable, and, and that's a good thing. We need to protect our ending fund balance given the rough sailing that we're gonna have next year. So the multi-year outlook, let's look at this. There's, look at that revenue line. It looks great, but then we kind of stall out as you can see there, we were expecting that. What you're seeing there is, is the, um, uh, the lack of, uh, I'm sorry, the, the going away of the COVID money. Esser. Yes, thank you, ESSER. And so you see that stall out. And so as a result, we have uh, the expense and other financing uses. That's it's running, real, running a little hot and uh, we'll fix that, we'll sharpen our pencil figure that out, but we uh, expect to have that figured out by 25, 26. And then <clears throat> Dr. Smith, some time ago, encouraged us, hey, you know, we need some leading indicators to, you know, show us like, hey, if, if we're gonna have a problem, right? And, and kind of what we need to do to activate in, in case we need to make changes. And so um, what we're looking here, looking at here is some financial activators. And on the left-hand side, you see some thresholds where we have a favorable, acceptable, and an evaluate, and those are the actions. And so evaluate would be like, oh, whoa, we need to take a look at this if we fall below a certain threshold. And so um, the first item there, when you look at routine restricted maintenance as a percent of total expenditures plus transfers out, that's really, are we maintaining our facilities? We need to maintain them. And that's just the maintenance piece. And so when you look at that, and I'm happy to put on all of these, we're either acceptable or favorable, which is really uh, wonderful. And so you can see there where we have a, a minimum of 4% that we're supposed to apply to that, and we're well above that, and that's good. Other post-employment benefit liability funding, this is uh, to fulfill our obligation with our employees um, and to make sure that we have money set aside to cover the obligation we have for uh, retirement, ages 55 through 65, and we're funding that, and we're actually increasing that in 24-25. Workers' compensation liability funding, we're above the um, actuarial central estimate, and so that's great. And then Moody's credit rating, A1, this is really important, especially if we were ever to go out to um, general obligation funds, uh, general obligation bond debt, uh, having a, um, a really high credit rating saves the taxpayers a whole lot of money. And then the unrestricted general fund balance change, that's a, um, that's a real indicator of how we're doing year to year. And you can see there we're, we're green into the blue. Property tax revenue change is, is doing well at the same time. We have a, a general fund reserve for economic uncertainties. We're meeting that, that requirement there. And then cash flow, really, really important to us, especially when the state, we know in the, during the last recess, recession, the state borrowed $11 billion, $11 billion from school districts. We need to have that cash to be able to not have to go to the, the money changers and pay all that money to have them uh, let us borrow some, um, some money to keep us uh, solvent. So with that then, I'd just like to recommend uh, approval of the second interim with a positive certification. Do we have any comments? Trustees? All right. I, oh, I, just had, I just had one comment since we base everything on our property tax. I was just reading something recently that was talking about um, the four cities in Orange County that continue to have home prices that are going up um, despite very little housing growth. Um, and Newport Beach um, was 
the highest in the county and in several counties in California. And so it didn't seem like the numbers were going down maybe as much as we had anticipated. So I just, because some of this was not as specific, because um, I think we don't necessarily know exactly, but um, I just was wondering if we we're slightly less concerned than we were maybe when the initial state budget came out, just about our, lo our, our local property um, and how much the housing prices continue to go up. It's true that the housing market here has been robust and that's been very helpful and that will probably uh, provide us with a modicum of uh, breathing room to handle what the state's going to uh, sling at us next year. Good, so just not as dire. I think like three months ago, I think we all were thinking it was very, it was more dire, but maybe not necessarily because we might be getting a lot of property tax revenue if it continues for one more year. And hopefully the state budget will go back to being better. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, do I have a motion to oh, approve? Trustee, Trustee Murphy. Oh, I was just oh, going to, I was just going to add. Sure. Thank you, Jeff. I think your uh, worries are, uh, very valid. Uh, what I've been hearing from the state is it's probably going to be worse than what they're even saying right yeah. now. So yep. Um, yep. it doesn't matter about the property taxes. They're going to try and claw back every dime they can. So um, I applaud you for being cautious because I think we're going to need to be. Thank you. Well, I mean, unless you want to spend it on, you know, something fun like, you know, a pool for all of us or heaters or something like that. No, just textbook adoptions. Okay. <laughs> awesome. I mean, we might we might use a heater here because I'm I shivering like. <laughs> 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 all right. Thank you for the report. Um, do we have a motion to approve 21B? So moved. Second. Okay, uh, moved by Trustee Wigand and seconded by Trustee, was it Pearson or Murphy? Pearson. All right, thank you. Roll call vote. Student board member Sailor Reddick? Yes. <laughs> Trustee Crane? Yes. Trustee Wigand? Yes. Trustee Osoilu? Yes. Trustee Barto? Yes. Trustee Murphy? Yes. Trustee Pearson? Yes. Trustee Anderson? Yes. All right, the vote passes. Um, 7-0 and one student board preferential vote. Uh, we will move on to 21C, which is approved CSBA Delegate Assembly election for 2024. Dr. Smith. The Delegate Assembly is CSBA's main policymaking body. Each year they look for nominations for representatives to join that group. This year they're looking for seven nominations from our region, and there are seven folks on the list. All right, so do we have a motion to approve the Delegate Assembly election for 2024 for CSBA? I'll make that motion. Thank you. I'll second. All right, moved by Trustee Bartow. I just ask for clarification that all seven, is that oh. Yes, I move to approve all seven. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Clarify Since there are seven on the ballot. Yes. All right. Uh, for all seven. Moved by Barto and seconded by Pearson. Roll call vote. Student board member Sailor Reddick? Yes. Trustee Crane? Yes. Trustee Wigan? Yes. Trustee Osoilu? Yes. Trustee Barto? Yes. Trustee Murphy? Yes. Trustee Pearson? Yes. Trustee Anderson? Yes. All right, the motion passes unanimous. Thank you. Uh, 21D, adopt the 2024 board governance protocols. Dr. Smith. Yeah, each year that I've been here, we get together in January-ish to look at our agreements, our board protocols. Um, we started with this three years ago. Each year we revisit them and, and make some edits. Um, we recently had that meeting January 31st, and the draft in front of you represents those edits made during that meeting to the best of our ability and recollection. Okay. Trustees, do we have any comments? Did you all get to glance at it and it looked like what we discussed? All right, 
So do we have a motion to approve our new board protocols for uh, 2024? So moved. I'll second. All right, so we have uh, Trustee Anderson who made the motion and Trustee Barto who seconded it. Thank you. Roll call vote. Student board member Sailor Reddick? Yes. Trustee Crane? Yes. Trustee Wigan? Yes. Trustee Osoilu? Yes. Trustee Barto? Yes. Trustee Murphy? Yes. Trustee Pearson? Yes. Trustee Anderson? Yes. All right, motion passes. Thank you. 7 0 with one preferential vote. Uh, we now move on to resolution adoption calendar 22A, adopt resolution number 140324, finding the addition of portable buildings at various campuses exempt from the California Environmental Quality Act and approving the filing and rec recordation of a notice of exemption. Mr. Trader? The district would like uh, flexibility to drop relocatables at East Bluff, California, Killybrook, Newport Heights, and Victoria. This is a finding that indicates that the capacity by uh, student capacity will, won't, will not be increased by more than 25%, and therefore it's an exemption with CEQA. Any questions, comments? All right, do we have a oh, motion? I just have one question. Yes. Um, thank you. Um, does that have any... Um, is it guaranteed that no trees would be removed or anything? That it's just going to be put on flat space wherever it's available. That's correct. That There's no impact the natural trees environment where we're going to be the location? planning to drop them. Okay. Yep. Awesome. All right. Do we have a motion? So moved. A second. A second. All right. Moved by Trustee Wigand. Seconded by Trustee Pearson. Roll call vote. Trustee Crane. Yes. Trustee Wigand. Yes. Trustee Osoilu. Yes. Trustee Barto? Yes. Trustee Murphy? Yes. Trustee Pearson? Yes. Trustee Anderson? Yes. Thank you. The motion passes. Uh, let's go on to adopt, uh, 22B, adopt resolution number 15324 to standardize district facility components for the designation of specific materials, products, things, or services on public works projects, Bosch Security Systems Incorporated. Mr. Trader. So the district's planning on uh, putting cameras at all of our sites, and, and these cameras are um, set up to um, integrate with access control and, and other systems. And as a result, we uh, are asking for a procurement exception that will allow us to uh, make a standard that will, with all of the components that we have to buy to make this system work together, that they will work with the Bosch security system. Any questions? All right, so um, do I have a motion? So moved. Second. All right, Trustee Wigand made the motion and seconded by Trustee Ersoilu. Roll call vote, please. Trustee Crane? Yes. Trustee Wigand? Yes. Trustee Ersoilu? Yes. Trustee Barto? Yes. Trustee Murphy? Yes. Trustee Pearson? Yes. Trustee Anderson? Yes. All right, thank you. The thank motion you passes. We move on to 22C. Adopt resolution number 160324 to approve agreement FCI SDS-17, sorry, SD5-17 with the Children and Families Commission of Orange County for 2024 to 2027. Dr. Sir? Yes, this is a, a, an agreement to approve uh, with the Children and Families Commission of Orange County. It's an award to Newport Mesa for roughly $450,000. Earlier today, we had Michael Martin with us, who is the official policy and government affairs manager for First Five. And um, a lot of really good things can happen out of this. Two specific areas I wanted to touch on real quick is the early developmental index. You heard her talk about the importance of how funds are allocated based off of the data that we get for the early developmental index. And specifically, next year we'll be working with all kindergarten teachers to do these assess this particular assessment that assesses five different domains. It's like over, it's like, I think it's like 103 questions that we have our teachers uh, ask all of our students to really build a nice data set to get an understanding of 
what is happening in our students' lives, how are they, how are they doing on different developmental models, and the, the data is fantastic. So we're excited that this goes towards funding that, um, that piece for our kindergarten teachers. And then the other piece that is really exciting, is, and we're still in the planning phases of it, is uh, developing a learning link. And we had a learning link in Newport Mesa prior to the pandemic, and that was with one of our community partners, which was great. Um, and bringing that back, that's going to make it so that and when we talk about wanting to support our families who are in need, who really need assistance in regards to resources to develop the interactions that can be strong between a child and a parent in those first years from zero to five, uh, the Learning Link is a powerful tool. It provides for parent-child interactions, provides for uh, referrals for services, uh, developmental screenings, uh, and really allows for interactions with professionals, nurses, speech pathologists, community liaisons, so that parents can come in and work with a lot of different areas in order to get a better understanding of the services that are available and also uh, good, good support in regards to really developing strong bonds between families and children. And that's a, certainly a wonderful goal for us to support and we're excited about the potential with what we're looking at bringing back to Newport Mesa. Okay. I, I have a, are there any questions? I have a couple. Sure. Yeah. Um, Thank you. We, one of the um, things that was brought up during DWAC that we recently had, um, Kathleen Larry was there and it was really wonderful to see the parent engagement and a lot of the questions that came up and the amazing resources that are being created that are examples that help parents understand what exactly are the qualifiers and what is meant within EDI. Um, and I think it's particularly important um, for our community because there's big pieces like a lay person may not know what gross motor skills means for their four-year-old. And so I think explaining what those are and having practical examples, particularly because a majority of our kids are coming in now missing that because they're on iPads and screens all day. Um, and so that's really important. And then the social emotional piece I think is key in our community particularly. Um, and so I think it would be really great too to continue to expand on this. I know there's a lot of portions about family and community engagement, but um, over the summer, just really, I, you know, our facilitators aren't working over the summer, but that is a key time to be interacting with community members and making sure that kids that are starting kindergarten have all of the, the skills and tools and are equipped and their parents know what they'll need for kindergarten. So thank you. Yes, thank you. Dr. Sert, if you can give me some historical context, um, did we not do EDI surveying or we just didn't do it in kindergarten? Um, we've been doing the EDI for many years in okay. Newport Mesa. And this is, we're just partnering with a specific group that will help us? Yes, this is, uh, this is all based off of Prop 10 funding that started back in 1998. And it used to be a lot heavier, but it's, it's still significant for us. It's funding we'll receive over the course of three years. And um, I, I'd have to ask Kathleen, is it on a every other year cycle? Two. Every three years, it's a, every three year cycle that um, we ask our kindergarten teachers to oh, okay. assess all of our kindergarten students in regards to the 103 different questions that touch on five different domains, including physical health, social competence, emotional maturity, language and cognitive development, and communication skills and general knowledge. So those are those five areas that we assess the students on. It's it's time consuming, but the data that we get out oh, of it is, is wonderful. Sure. Yeah. When they yeah. do it by precinct, so it's not even just the elementary school, it's by precinct. So the community and family <laughs> engagement data is yeah. very rich. That's yeah, great. you can see a neighborhood and how yeah. it's doing, wow. which is very helpful. And see, so yeah, I see it's cohort. in a three year cycle. That's why every three years we pass a resolution. Yes. I get it. Okay, all right, thank you. All right, so do we have a motion? Motion. Second. All right. Um, moved by Trustee Arsoilu and seconded by Trustee Anderson. Roll call vote. Trustee Crane? Yes. Trustee Wigan? Yes. Trustee Arsoilu? Yes. Trustee Bartow? Yes. Trustee Murphy? Yes. Trustee Pearson? Yes. Trustee Anderson? Yes. All right. Great. The motion passes. Thank you. And now we move on to informal reports. Dr. I wanted to uh, share this after the fact. I didn't want it to seem like I was convincing you to agree to our protocols, but I've had a chance to, in the last three years, probably sit on seven statewide panels.
talking about effective governance, and I talk about you and what you do, that you're intentional about the professionalism, how you treat one another in our community, and how you do this work. It's exemplary, and tonight's protocol uh, adoption is yet another example of that. Great teams are great because they're intentional about being great. So I just want to thank you for doing that each year. Um, I want to talk about telling our story a little bit. Uh, my first interaction with Dr. Soilu, th I'm pretty sure she talked to me about T. Winkle electives. There could have been trees in a conversation. It could have been trees and electives, but it was certainly about T. Winkle electives. And I got to meet Assistant Superintendent Torres, and she was well on her way in working with that. This last week, I got to go to Future Trojan Night at T. Winkle, and it was such an impressive event. The energy, the information, the participation by classified and certificated alike was awesome. And it was so cool to see the, the myriad of opportunities those students have, including the increased electives like green engineering. I mean, so cool for them to have that, Spanish, et cetera. Um, it didn't end there, though, although it was a great event. They love our counselors over at oh. T. Winkle right now. They dressed up like Care Bears and did a dance to We Care. People lost their minds. I was just glad no one got hurt because they're in those blow-up suits they can't see. And I'm just going, no workers' comp, no workers' comp, no workers' comp. Um, no one got hurt. But I went to Victoria to watch Beauty and the Beast and celebrate that Friday night with some folks. And two parents come up to me and said, we're stalking you, which is always a great way to start a conversation <laughs> with someone in a public position. Uh, and they said, no, we were at T. Winkle night, and that was so cool. We're so excited to send our kids to T. Winkle, right? A couple nights later. This week, my cult's going to be having their future Trojan night, their Estancia, future Eagle night, rather, their Estancia night. Um, and I hope people go out and support that. I love the way our teams are celebrating their successes, telling their story, and the kind of energy that provides our community. These are great schools with so much to celebrate. We heard a bit tonight about advocacy, and I just want to let folks know that this governance team takes that seriously, as do I. Friday, I'll be sitting on a panel with Orange County superintendents, and we have most of the elected officials in our area committed to being there. I'll be handling the budget area because Jeff does such a good job of mentoring and tutoring me. And we'll be advocating in California for those things um, that Jeff put on the screen. I would add to that that we're also going to advocate for flexibility with the funds we've been provided, things like Prop 28. Um, it's silly uh, in times like these to overly restrict resources that our students and communities sorely need, especially with the budget outlook that we have. But it doesn't stop there. This weekend, we're traveling with our advocates, capital advisors, to DC um, to do several days of advocacy at the federal level. Um, lots of topics, uh, IDEA, and some, some new movement. It seems like there's always every year some movement, but hopefully this will take root. Where the federal government will own that responsibility to fund 40% of the cost of special education. They've never done more than 12%. I'm an English teacher, so the math is hard for me. But I know that's not nearly close enough for them. Um, school meals, other provisions that will help us recruit and retain teachers in California. So we're excited as a team to go do that work. I'll be doing some more on Friday. We take advocacy for and on behalf of our students seriously. Um, and we expect outcomes that those elected officials listen and do the right thing uh, when they have the opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Smith. We'll begin with Trustee Murphy, and then go this way, and then back to Anderson Pearson, and then Kate Crane. Uh, sure. Well, good luck, Superintendent Smith, with uh, Washington, D.C. You have fun with that. Um, <laughs> we'll try. Uh, so not too much, just uh, Costa Mesa High School Foundation. We had our grants approval meeting last week and we approved twenty thousand dollars in grants we'll probably do another round so that's the Seegerstrom um uh endowment that is going that estancia has and costa mesa has their own um so 
the Seegerstroms are listening. Thank you for that. It, uh, it goes to some great programs. It goes to Mesa. Um, I think they we're going to also have a little bit more left over that can help uh, Dr. Potnas with some, um, I think I told you, Wes, the STAR program, she wants to implement some more incentive-based uh, programs for the students to help with positive behaviors and, and uh, more positive outcomes with interactions with the students. So we're really excited to support her in that effort. She's, um, she's very committed to, uh, to the culture of kindness and, um, and aware of the student needs in Costa Mesa. So I just applaud her and her team for that because um, I know it's not I know it's not easy uh, I will say too um, I wish she was still here uh, I was there on Friday dropping off um, dropping off some donations for the Costa Mesa middle school dance and there was uh, a play going on in the theater there was a, um, a swim meet there was uh, Friday night lights there was um, the dance, obviously. There was, um, I think there was people on the football field, people on the baseball <laughs> field. <laughs> I mean, it was just a complete zoo. I've never seen so many people at one place at one time in my entire life. And um, <laughs> I mean, honestly, if you want to know where everybody in Costa Mesa is on Friday, <laughs> it's Mesa, like, yeah. go it's to Mesa. A, it's at the high school right there. Yeah. And um, the fact that she and her team and Jeff's team obviously managed to orchestrate all of that. So, um, so nicely, I mean, people aren't at least screaming at each other and freaking out, and so, you know, that's always nice to see. So, um, Dr. Potnas and her team, if you're listening, uh, I just want to thank you for how well you orchestrate that and manage all of that craziness. Um, and yes, come down to Costa Mesa on Friday nights, and you will find an activity that you <laughs> like to do. Um, and then um, I also got a chance to go to uh, Kaiser Woodlands, or Kaiser's actually, um, play at, at uh, Estancia, which I did not realize we still had a theater in Estancia, so um, that was nice to see. It's a little theater, it's super cute. Um, the Kaiser kids did a great job with Little Mermaid. Um, the PFO supports it, and they did a great job, so thank you to the Kaiser Woodland PFO for all of their efforts. Uh, they go above and beyond every time to support uh, the play for Kaiser. The kids were great. Um, had a ton of fun and the and the it was sold out every show for the for the Kaiser Little Mermaid play was sold out so it's just another testament to how um, well our students are um, are engaged in the arts how important it is to them how um, how important it is to our families and our communities to keep up with the arts and to keep um, those activities going and so I just applaud all of our teachers and staff and our team that really take that seriously because it clearly means a lot to our families. So thank you for that. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, last week, um, the Newport Harbor High had their grade wars, which um, I wasn't planning on attending, but I was driving by and heard it over the loudspeaker, so I pulled over yeah. to watch. Um, it sounded really fun, and you know, the seniors have to win. The seniors did win, so <laughs> that's pretty great. Um, talk about the things that uh, schools do to make the last few weeks of school um, enter engaging and entertaining and everyone gets really into those so that was really fun to watch. Um, they also had their play high school their spring musical high school musical which was very fun and well done um, great singing all around. Um, I attended Harbor Council PTA's meeting and uh, again thank you to Trustee Crane and thank you to uh, the mayors of city the cities of Costa Mesa and Newport Beach. Um, the PTA has really appreciated the recognition a lot of um, effort goes into the things that we have at our school sites and um, people do say thank you but I think that little recognition meant a lot more than um, we had intended so that was great um, and then um, additionally CSBA legislative week is this week so I'll be meeting with other CSBA members from around Orange County with various um, legislators to talk about Prop 98 funding, among other things, which is the, the, the big topic, and not um, cutting that and not um, changing the way that's funded. Uh, let's see, on Friday, I'll be headed up to Sacramento for part of the CSBA Delegate Assembly, um, and we'll have a report back with what um, pieces of legislation they are supporting or opposing uh, and why they made those recommendations. Um, and then 
Next week, Harbor Council has their recognition dinner for a lot of our administrators um, throughout the district. So that will be a big, actually, no, that's tomorrow. Um, I'll be doing that tomorrow. <laughs> and then the week, it's going to be busy. And then the week after that, um, uh, Newport L and Newport Heights have their gala fundraisers. Newport Harbor had their fundraiser on Friday for their foundation. And uh, Newport L will have theirs and Newport Heights will have theirs the 22nd and 23rd. So um, even if you can't attend, feel free to support. They do a lot of good things for our families. That's it. Hmm? Oh, and the sailing team has their, yes, it's a very busy week. The sailing team has their banquet on Friday, so I will be getting off of my plane from Sacramento and then going over to the sailing team gala for Newport Harbor and CDM, and I will be doing check-in, so uh, it'll be a busy day. Um, thank you, Trustee Murphy, for the shout out to Estancia's Theater because it's awesome. It's like the little theater that could. It's magical. I'm sure I'll like the new one eventually too, but I really <laughs> love the one that's there too. <laughs> the one there now is pretty awesome. So um, thank you for that. And yes, the future Eagles night, I forget the night it is, but I need to get my daughter there. So yes, okay. we, will be <laughs> we will be heading there. Um, and I just want to thank all the staff for your dedication to data. It came up so many times tonight. It made me so happy. And as a former <laughs> first five commissioner, I cannot thank you for just doing EDI. Just do it correctly. And if everyone does it correctly, then we have great data for the whole county. It's magical how that works. So thank you so much for doing that. And um, thank you to, is it Brianna, the student from Newport yeah. Harbor? Yeah. Um, I think we can all learn a lesson from what Brianna said. So whenever you do have assessments or like the healthy kids survey or things like that to do snacks and make it like a festive time like hey <laughs> let's all do our assessments and surveys um, and that's how they get done so thank you to Brianna wherever you are right now um, that was a really important point you made earlier so thank you all right, about two weeks ago, I was able to attend um, the CAF finals for, the, uh, for soccer. Um, and we had Newport Harbor High School boys uh, playing against Foothill um, High School. And I uh, attended, and it was so great to see as I, as I got there. They were up 4-0, uh, um, battled the second half, uh, and uh, the outcome became 4-3. Uh, and so um, Newport Harbor won, and it was just... It was exciting to see them beat um, um, a team that that was, you know, a little scrappy at times, and we kept our cool. And you know, it, as um, I think one thing is, yeah, we we won, we won the title, but the other uh, team was, you know, yelling things uh, at Newport Harbor, and Newport Harbor just stayed classy and clapped and you know supported them. So that was. That was a, a good thing to watch. Um, but another thing that was heartwarming is that after it, after the game, um, you know, they're passing around the CIF uh, banner or um, trophy, and there were some members from the 1977, I think, class at wow. Newport Harbor of the soccer, wow. uh, at uh, the soccer team there. And um, the man of the match was um, the, this um, student that did not have a letterman's jacket. So the person um, from 1977 gave him wow. um, his letterman's jacket wow. and, um, you know, thanked him for, for doing such a great job. Um, that was really heartwarming. And then because I couldn't get more uh, soccer, I couldn't get enough, I stayed around for Estancia's um, uh, girls, CIF, and uh, that was so exciting to watch because we were um, playing against a, a team named Campbell Hall, anyways, a private school in, from Studio City. And as I saw Estancia, you know, um, smaller school, obviously, than Harbor, but they had more people in the stands than Harbor. So oh, that was wow. amazing to see. Um, everyone had giant cutouts of their favorite player. Um, the family, w all the families were there. Um, students were there supporting their, their team. Um, and I have to say, it was so amazing to watch these girls battle. And in the second half, they blew it wide open, and it was, I think, 2, two nothing at the end. Um, and one thing I looked, and I was like, hmm, Campbell Hall, I've never heard of them. And so I went to just see, you know, what the private school was. It's uh, $51,000 a year. <laughs> but uh, you know what? You can't buy a CIO title. title. <laughs> so you got to earn it. Go. Yep. You got to earn it. And it, it was just really heartwarming to win that. Um, and then to, uh, to showcase the CIO banner with all of the families that were passing it back and forth. And it was just a great moment. So I'm proud of all of them. I'm proud of our soccer teams. 
and we'll see him next week or yep. next month. Yep. All right, uh, Trustee Anderson. Oh, thank you. Um, yes, it was very exciting with the Estancia girls yeah. winning. Their team is really great. It's great to see a, a team like that like go from just humble beginnings to doing so well so quickly. Um, I was able to participate in Wilson Elementary's Read Across America. Um, I got to read with a second grade class and a fourth grade class, and the second graders could not believe that I attended Wilson a very long time ago. <laughs> they were like, they were really excited that I was one room over from where I, my second grade class had been. Um, so that was really fun. I got to read them Snowflake Bentley, one of my favorite books about individual snowflakes and microscopes. Um, they loved it. That was great. Um, and I got to also attend the Victoria Elementary um, Beauty and the Beast with the amazing Nicholas St. Royal. Um, and Kathy Walker was his assistant director. And um, I have known Kathy and her son since he was in, I think, first grade. Um, and it was great to see her go from being um, involved at California to being involved at the show choir at California. And then he got so enamored with drama that he applied to OSHA and got in. And he's doing drama and clarinet. Um, and so it's just cool that his mom comes back to Victoria and says all the time that she loves Victoria so much, she'll come back for every single performance ever to help. Um, and then I also just had a request um, in our minutes. I would love to add in just a little more detail for um, our CSCA and M NMFT representatives. I've been noticing that it just says they spoke, and I would love to have just like a sentence that says, what they spoke on for reference. And um, if 20 years from now we want to look at those, we will see what those topics were. Um, I think that's really important. Um, and then this weekend, I or this week, I have um, site visits at Whittier and Victoria and Ray. And then um, on March 29th, Pomona and Wilson. Um, and then I also just kind of wanted to know a little bit more about um, the claims that we have. We have a, um, 19A, 20, and 21 that are very small amounts that are related to things that happened um, related to staff when they were at work. And so I was just wondering how we decide those, if there's any policies, if there could be some small changes. And so I just would love to learn more about that. And I'm very excited about all of the focus around the early developmental index and early childhood. So thank you for all of the work and attention and positive engagement that we're seeing around that. So that's it. Thank you. Um, well, I got to visit Harborview twice um, this month. One was for their ancient Greece showcase, which was fantastic, and their jogathon. Um, their jogathon's theme was "Run as One," um, and you can tell it's just there's nothing cuter than seeing all those kids, the whole entire school in the exact same T-shirt, um, running for the same cause, um, and it's it's one of my favorite things to visit. Um, got to enjoy the CDM Orcasis um, show, which is always like being on Broadway. Um, absolutely fantastic um, and fun to be at. Um, Carol and I got to go surprise to, I don't know if we're allowed to say the winners yet, but um, two of the honorary um, PTA honorary service award winners. So that is always fun. Um, I think the theme this month was basically our community and our parents and how, um, how fortunate we are to have have such an amazing community and um, parent support. Um, and it was, that was lovely. Oh, and I'm looking forward to Wizard of Oz, Newport Coast Elementary is Wizard of Oz. Uh, that's March 23rd and 24th. And Harper Views play is coming up, and that's this weekend. What are they doing? You know, I don't know what doing. The arts are alive and well, <laughs> truly. Nice. Yes. All right, well, in uh, light of, of um, Founders Day, PTA's Founders Day, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing to, to celebrate volunteers. And it was a, as an honor and a privilege to be able to go to Harbor Council PTA and present these awards per site. And I think a lot of them were, were very interested in how many years their PTA was, was uh, when it was founded and how many years they had been around. And wow, 98 years Newport L. That was before Harbor Council PTA was founded because we were celebrating the 70th. So. 
Wow. But I, I, I also wanted to recognize our PFOs who are also part of our community. And so they, they're, they elect to be PFOs, but they're also part of us and they're volunteers. So thank you to the PFOs. I believe it's Harborview and, and Kaiser Woodland. So also a shout out to them. Um, we I would like to thank the 7-Eleven committee. Um, they've been work, working hard and their work is done. And I see, I think, one representative here today, tonight. So thank you for and your work. early college high school graduate. <coughs> oh, here you are. Costa Mesa. Oh, I thought you went to early college. So Sorry. thank thank you for your work. Uh, we will be working on that uh, and moving forward. So we just appreciate the time and investment uh, you put into our community. So thank you. Um, I also would like to um, announced that Battle of the Bay is coming up. Uh, Battle of the Books, apologies. Battle of the Books is coming up <laughs> yeah, next week. There's a Battle of the Bay, there's a Battle of the Bay volleyball game. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's East Bluff, Newport Ells, Sonora, Newport Coast, Anderson, and Our Lady Queen of Angels are looking forward. And I know that um, East Bluff sponsors the event in the sense that they facilitate the whole, the whole event. And it's just absolutely so fun to see these kids so excited about reading. And I know that they sent an invite to uh, the board and uh, superintendent and admin. So come if you can. It's on March 21st at the Oasis uh, Senior Center. We are going to, uh, we, at, we attended the CDM WASC uh, final summary uh, last week. <coughs> and the results of, and the comments by the team that evaluated uh, Corona Del Mar High School was just so glowing and it was a couple of the statistics that blew me away is that 90% of the students on campus are engaged in an activity. Like meaning not school, but like clubs or athletics or dance, 90% engagement. That's, that's pretty amazing. And that's how they stay in school because school matters. Um, so, um, read Across America, I, was, I had the honor of going to Wilson Elementary. I saw Trustee Anderson as uh, I was leaving as you were going in, and I, I got the pleasure to read to a preschool, a preschool class and a first grade class. And I didn't want to leave, really, but I had to because I had other things to go to. But they were so adorable, and it was just wonderful, again, celebrating literacy. And um, speaking of what we do, our work, we, we're not just internal. We just don't work locally. We are also the face in Sacramento and in DC. And this is why I'm glad that we, you know, I went to Sacramento Safari last week and we're going to DC next week because we need to let our politicians, our elected officials know that education matters at all levels. And so thank you for the opportunity to, um, um, for us to go and make you know, be in front of these, you know, Congress people who make these laws. And uh, another one I think we should, we should talk about is uh, universal broadband. I think that's, that's a big one. Yeah. So anyway, thank you. And uh, that's it. Carol, CDM Home Tour. Oh, CDM Home Tour coming up, 50th anniversary, March 20. No, it's Thursday. Is it this Thursday? Oh, March, uh, what is this it? Thursday. This Thursday. Uh, I believe that there will be a proclamation at 9.30 by Mayor O'Neill, and also uh, Dr. Smith will be there, and so will, will some of us as well. So um, it's pretty amazing. Eight homes, can't wait. So, yeah, CDM Home Tour. All right, meeting adjourned, 9.16. Thank you.